creating cosmos out of chaos. While you left your university assignments until the night before you had to hand them in, and it's the reason why your tax returns always get done the day before, even though you've had three months to complete them. And conversely, if you start to ramp up the amount of work you do and you set yourself deadlines, you will begin to work at the rate you need to publish. You don't miss, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't miss deadlines. If I've got a thing that needs to go out, maybe I'll have to wait. It'll be a late night finish and I'll hate myself, but it'll get done. And then if you start to pull that away, you're still working. Your Parkinson's law is lagging behind the new, now down-regulated amount of work that you need to do. But your work rate is still at the previous one. So you're running on a treadmill quicker than the treadmill's going. Uh, and I think that you feel that if you ever try to pull back the amount of work, it feels like something's going wrong. So I... That's really funny because traditionally with the things we do, we set very aggressive deadlines and somehow we are always like, how the fuck do we always come right to the minute? Yeah. Like right. Parkinson's law, man. That's to hear that. Actually, Never actually heard a term for our insanity. <laughs> well, it's, it feels better. It feels better it when you it's realize like, okay, the concept. We're, it's, we're not no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not a maniac. This is Parkinson's law. That's so funny. Like we literally do. everything we even, so this thing we do every year is we create these premium programs for our community and it's like a yoga program mixed with meditation. Sometimes it's, it's like a really year. intense fitness one. And we're always like, okay, this year we're going to film it in September. So then. Bags of time. Yeah. And so every year it's released January 1st. It's always like the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. So like, so that when it comes to Christmas and December, we can actually like take some time for ourselves with family, not have to feel like there's a fire drill. We keep backing it up. Every oh, are you monopodding as well? You guys are not playing about. <laughs> I like it. This is very similar to the setup I use for my um, my big episodes as well. Nice. Yeah, very cool. What I think was really interesting was you, Juliana, talking about the setup of this July, January 1st thing that we do every year. Mm. Mm. And we do all these pre-sales and the market, like get set it all up. The community's really excited and we always end up working to Christmas. And no, no, this is like, New Year's Eve. Yeah, we're like all the way doing up to the, the very things. minute because like we keep Year's pushing Eve the right limit and pushing the, first, the limit, yeah. and then mm -hmm. like it's like no, it can be better, it can be this, it can be that, and pushing and pushing and pushing, and then like it comes down to like a click of a button, like at a minute too. You know, it's, it's difficult because there's this balance right between being a perfectionist and iterating quickly enough to be able to publish things fast enough to work out what works. Mm -hmm. So procrastination for most people shows up in really strange ways. Perfectionism is procrastination masquerading as quality control. And yeah. a lot of people use perfectionism as an excuse to not ship things at a pace required to find out what works. If you decide to hold it off and hold it off and hold it off until it's 99, 99.1, 99.2% mm -hmm. perfect, it actually insulates you from ever having to deal with negative feedback from the market. And that's something that a lot of people fall into. Now, the problem is, you have to have sufficiently good quality that it makes you stand out. Yeah. But if you try and overcook the quality, you could get two pieces of 98% content out in the time it gets one 99.1% piece mm -hmm. of content. And you go, okay, well, which one's going to make the better impact? Well, probably two 98s, right? right? Um, so it's all about knowing the tolerance. How much mm -hmm. should I push in terms of perfection and how quickly do I need to be able to publish? It can be so crippling for people too. Like it can literally hold them back from doing everything they want to do. And then make the, like you're saying, like if the impact isn't strong enough, what's fascinating is then they get this, this feedback loop of like, if it was more frequent, it would be a bigger impact, which would feed them to create more content and which can be very discouraging. And then you see people give up on their dreams really quickly where it, it's funny if you, and I find that's fun, like paired with that seems to be an idea of like looking for a result rather than figuring out that the process of the creation of what it is you're doing, if you find like a solace and a, and, and a fulfillment inside of that, um, that can be enough to keep you going rather than hoping, oh, how many people watched it? Or what was, what were the comment section? Or how many followers do I have? Like all of this weird result-based sort of content driving, I think that actually ruins the process of like, it's just, we're just communicating energy here. Like it's just about sharing, sharing what you have, the skills you have, the perspectives you have, whatever it might be, just the talents you have. And then people get so caught up and oh, no one's watching it. It's like, well, maybe if you did it more and didn't worry so much about it and, and fall into that rhythm. And I think, you know, when you entered and you told us you're doing three podcasts a week, I mean, that's beautiful. Like, what do you think about like the process of that? Is it, like, how do you deal with looking at a result versus loving the process of what you're doing? I'm going to give you another law here, which is Goodhart's law. Good uh, heart. 
Good Hart's Law. Yeah. yeah. When a measure becomes an outcome, it ceases to be a good measure. So let's say that you had the measure of uh, getting as many newsletter subscribers as possible, and you decided that you were going to say a million dollars to every person that signs up to my email list, and then everybody signed up, but you didn't give anybody a million dollars, and it was like, got your emails now, ha 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 ha. <laughs> the measure became the outcome, the measure of I want as many newsletter subscribers as possible. But the actual outcome that you wanted was, I want a newsletter list of people who care about my work and are interested and genuinely bought in and I can have a parasocial relationship with. And the same thing goes for any time you look at a dashboard. You could optimize for plays by calling this a crazy naked yoga party or something, right? And everybody's gonna watch, they go, oh my God, like this is a naked yoga party. And then they come on and they don't get delivered what they want. So you've managed to optimize for views, but it wasn't actually views that you were looking to optimize for. It was, I want to build a podcast that has engaged audience, that cares about what we say, blah, 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 blah. So my point being that a lot of the time, realizing what you're actually trying to optimize for is important. Um, when it comes to trying to focus on process rather than outcome, the easiest solution for this is just enjoy what you're doing. You guys know this. It's, it's if you enjoy what you're doing, then you don't think about other things. No. Now, that being said, it's easy to get caught up with, oh, well, I wish that this one had done better because I really loved it. Mm -hmm. And because I loved it, I want everybody else to yeah. love it. Now, that's hard. That's very difficult. But mm -hmm. again, if you come back to why am I doing this particular pursuit, starting a newsletter or a blog or something, mm -hmm playing music, spending more time with my kid, what's the outcome? Is it so I can get my kid into college or is it so that they grow up with a well-balanced and great relationship with their mother or father? Mm -hmm. You know, And I think that you can really only do this stuff once you've stepped away from whatever the practice is that you're doing. And a lot of the time we're so busy dealing with the urgent that we don't have time to look at the important. The urgent is whatever's straight in front of us, the fire that needs to be put out today. Kid needs to go to school, podcast needs to be published. Mm -hmm. You do need to give yourself a little bit of room to be able to sit back and go, okay, why am I doing the things that I'm doing? That's the important question, I think. And once you do that, that's your optimizing function. Okay, mm -hmm. why, it's a good example. Uh, I don't know how much truth there is in this, but it's illustrative, even if it's a lie. Uh, Elon Musk supposedly has one ordinating principle that everything goes through. And so does Jeff Bezos when he was at Amazon. And Bezos's was, does this make the customer experience better? And Musk's was, does this get us closer to Mars? It's incredibly easy to work out what you need to do in life, when to get up, who to speak to, what tasks to do, mm -hmm. what tasks not to mm -hmm. do, if there is a single unifying goal that you're moving toward. And the problem is that people want to try and do as much as possible at the moment. Mm -hmm. There is a multiplicity and endless number of things mm -hmm. that you could oh, yeah, do totally. with your life at the moment and uh you can be anything you want mm -hmm. but you can't be everything that you want like finding the why in everything that you do what is your why then it's difficult because it continues it's like layers it's got layers to it right and there's also the noble outward version and then there's the uh probably the the more real inner version i think for a long time my why was i wanted to be recognized by people and needed I was quite unpopular when I was younger, when I was in school, uh, I always felt alone. So what I wanted was to be able to put myself into a position where people needed me. And I didn't mind if they liked me or not. I realized that if they needed me, that was close enough to being liked that it wouldn't matter. Now, what I didn't realize is that you should be able to get yourself into a situation where people like you, regardless of whether you're offering them entry into a nightclub or insights from a podcast in any case. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just a, a pattern that I'm working myself through. But I would say at the moment, I. I have an insatiable curiosity that needs to be filled and the opportunity to use that to teach other people things is i can't every single day i think i can't believe this is a job i absolutely <laughs> cannot believe whatever version of the simulation that we're in that has allowed this to be a job is pretty mind-blowing i think that's a beautiful indication of being in service in the right place to yourself even um when your job feels like you know your play yeah your passion it's you know it's as if like, you can you do what you're doing without the idea of even getting any money for it right like that's a great measurement for it i would do it i would mm -hmm. still do this if nobody listened if nobody tuned in that's i would amazing. be 2 p.m every day i'd be sitting down and talking to a geneticist who's trying to re-engineer human dna so it can survive space flight or a porn star or a, <laughs> a strength and conditioning coach or whoever it is right i would be i, I would want to speak to them so in all of this discovery of like engagement with humans, right? Like you clearly like three times a week, exactly what you're saying. And you just gave three very stark 
different uh, examples. Is there a common thing that you've learned or a shift that you've seen towards how you perceive sort of the human journey, human <laughs> beings? Like, what are we doing here? Like, you know, what, where, what have you, what's revealed itself? I think that one of the common threads between most of the people that I speak to is a, a single ordinating principle like we spoke about before. There aren't many people that I speak to that are um, spreading themselves too thinly. And by design or by selection, I end up speaking to people that are pretty successful in whatever they do, which would suggest to me that the people who are unsuccessful in what they do probably have lots of things on their plate. Mm. Um, I think when it comes down to what constitutes a good life or how, how people should live, one of the most interesting things I've learned recently is uh, the two big Daniels of psychology from the last couple of decades, Daniel Kahneman and Dan Gilbert, have these two contrasting views of how happiness works. So Dan Gilbert's much more hedonic, and he says, if you spent every day for the remainder of your life in a pool with a, a lilo, a waterbed, and a cocktail in your hand, you would have lived a good life because every single moment involved pleasure. Every single moment was enjoyable. Now, in retrospect, let's say you had to get out to go to the bathroom or do whatever, you would look back and think, maybe I haven't spent my life in that good of a way, but you would get back to individual increments of pleasure all the way along. Daniel Kahneman has the opposite approach. He says that a good life is one which in retrospect, you're glad you lived. One would be about happiness and, and pleasure. The other would be more about meaning, right? And there's a genuinely interesting debate to be had here. Which one's right? You know, which one is correct? Well, it's interesting when you say about somebody that's just lounging in the pool, because don't you think if we all just lounged in the pool all day, every day, wouldn't life just get boring and purposeless? So you lean to purpose side. Is that what I feel like that's where true happiness is, is when you feel like I have a purpose on this planet. I'm in service. I'm actually bettering people's lives and whatever I'm doing, whether it's podcasting, teaching yoga, walking dogs, like whatever it is, right? You're, you're in service in some sort of way. And I think if we lose that lack of purpose, it's just boring. Honestly, it's, it's kind of how I sometimes, it's funny, we were talking about this before, you know, like the really crazy shit that's coming out like Epstein and like all this weird child pedophilia, like it's disgusting shit. And I always think about like, how can someone get to such a low, dark place to be able to actually commit these disgusting crimes. And then you look at it, all of these people that are accused of this, are all these like celebrities, politicians, like wealthy princes, right? Like, is it because they have everything they need? Like they can spend the whole life in the pool drinking margaritas, mm. but life is so boring and nothing excites them anymore. They can have private jets, they can have mansions. So then they turn into like really terrible things like abusing children because that's like the most extreme thing. Like, is this why we as human beings like get pulled towards this? The darkness. When we don't find a deeper purpose? If you've got no more struggles to fight against, how do you spend your time? You know, mm -hmm. the gold medalist syndrome, as it's called, you know, once you've completed that. I love all your syndromes. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. You have all these things. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. You love all of my syndromes. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, yeah. Just the consideration that after you have a huge achievement, what do you mm. do next? And yeah. the, the humans are built to not be happy. We're built to be effective. And a lot of that consists of us being purposefully dissatisfied with pretty much everything that we do. Mm. Like we're, we're not meant to take perfect satisfaction from all of the things. There's a, a, a quote which you guys may be familiar with. So the Buddha said, life is suffering, right? Now, the word suffering, dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A, is contested by some different scholars about what it means. Mm. And some of them say that it's not suffering, but unsatisfactoriness. Life is unsatisfactoriness. So an example of this would be um, before you go on holiday. So you have planned the holiday, you know, the hotel you're going to stay in, you know, the menu of the hotel, and you've planned the cocktails that you're going to have. And then you get out there on the plane, you've been dreaming of it for a couple of months time. And you get out there and you sit down at the table, the exact table that you chose in the exact hotel with the exact menu. But then you notice that there's some sand between your toes. And that's kind of irritating. And then mm. the sun's a little bit low 
and it's sort of hitting you in the eyes and you haven't got your nice sunglasses with you and you wish that you got the cocktail frozen in, in, instead of on the rocks actually now and then the, the, maybe I should have gone medium rare instead of medium well. My point being that in anticipation of everything, we can have an idealized version of the world. And in reality, it's always going to be tarnished in comparison. Your ability to be idealistic is always going to outstrips, uh, outstrip reality's ability to deliver that to you. And my point being that when you get to a level where pretty much anything is under your control, I think that you get a very skewed sense of how you should spend your time. And this can cause people to try and create military coups or enact power on young, vulnerable, innocent animals and children and things like that. Well, and you don't, I mean, it's funny of all the accusations and the situation with Epstein that you mentioned, it's like, you don't ever really hear about somebody who has a deep, meaningful purpose being involved in that. I mean, maybe you do, I don't know the list of names necessarily or the, that kind of thing. But... I mean, but purpose, it's such a specific word, right? I mean, when you look at it, somebody's purpose, for example, if we come here to, or evolve consciousness and settle some karma, then somebody's purpose can just be like, okay, life of leisure, mm -hmm. because they had a really tough one just before. I don't know if you believe in past lives, but if you look at it astrologically and karmically, some people just, they had a really tough time the last time. So their purpose might be just like chilling and drinking a margarita by the pool. And they can find a lot of joy in that. Mm. I don't know. I'm not one of these people, but right. I've seen it. Well, one way to split that Dan Kahneman versus Daniel Gilbert conversation, mm -hmm. and this is what I've come to believe about it, is that it's down to temperament. So if you're the sort of person that is more introspective, reflective, ruminative, mm -hmm. you will spend a lot of time looking backward and you will infer your current level of purpose, happiness, and meaning from how you've spent your time. Whereas if you're a little bit less introspective, less reflective, then you're going to be taking the moment for what it is. I mean, we've all got these friends, right? It'll be the people that you went to college with or whatever yeah. that are still just happy to go out. They spend yeah. their time with their kids. They still party on a weekend with their friends. And there is no sense of, I am not fulfilling my logos mm -hmm. and speaking my truth forward into Very the true. world. And you go, okay, well, is innocence bliss? Mm -hmm. Is ignorance bliss? It, it, does it permit people who do not know that they're missing out on something, do they suffer? I, I would say no. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem and the question, a lot of the time, this question gets asked by people for whom they can't see that ignorance. Mm -hmm. It's The Pandora's box has been opened and it's all over the floor now. I remember I saw the first time I ever saw Peterson live was in Manchester about four years ago. And someone asked him this question and he said, the depth of my consciousness causes me to suffer. Is ignorance bliss? Mm -hmm. Peterson took a little bit of time and he said, well, it's too bloody late for that now. The only way out is through. You need to take more of the thing that poisons you until you turn it into a tonic that girdles the world around you. And that was a very interesting way to look at it because you go, look, once you realize there is something outside of Plato's cave or Pandora's box or whatever allegory you want to use, mm -hmm. you can't unsee that. You can no longer unsee the fact that you know that there is something more that you could be doing with your life. And sure. there are inefficiencies and lapses in integrity that you have on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Now, you can try and hide away from this, and people do with drugs and alcohol and sex and yeah. social media. And, but I think that the beauty of the challenge is, okay, I have a heavy weight to bear. Mm -hmm. I have a heavier weight to bear than perhaps many people do, especially the people that are around me, maybe my parents, maybe my brothers. Okay, this is the battle that I've got. Mm -hmm. This is meaning. Reminds me a lot of your friends. <laughs> <laughs> my friends. You got party friends? I mean, like, I, he's got friends that literally, like, well, I, I do too, not as much as you, though, but that mm. literally have, are still living in the same little towns in Canada, hanging out with the same people that they went to high school with, they're married maybe to those people, and, and they're just like living this, they, you know, they live for the weekend, they dread their Mondays, and it's like this weird, Cycle. They're still like they're still in it. They're still in this cycle of like still snorting cocaine and going out on the weekends to like stay up till the sun comes up. Mm. You know, entering in their forties, you know, that Have kind kids, of thing. Like yeah. and and which, in a way, what you're saying is interesting because like I don't I try not I don't judge them for it. That's their reality, and in fact, some of them find great joy in that. And that's like and then I think that sometimes exactly how you put it, it's like is that and it's not like i don't even like saying is there ignorance bliss because it's not ignorance it's their reality their existence yes it's just correct. that's their reality yep. like just because my reality 
exists in a different place and I see the world a different way. It doesn't make me, it doesn't give me the right to say that that's ignorance in a way. We are, especially people that are introspective and like to consume pot, stuff like this, <laughs> we are far, far too quick to claim superiority over those people. For sure. Oh, totally. like, yeah. Now, if it's a person for whom they have got, and don't get me wrong, objectively, objectively, regardless of your view of reality, I think that not snorting cocaine in your 40s when you've got kids is, it's a suboptimal way to approach life. <laughs> I right? couldn't I agree that. more about that. <laughs> but, but my point being, if it's the person that, doesn't want to go traveling, that just wants to live a very simple life, doing a job that they oh. enjoy and spending their time with their family, that is no less of a glorious existence. I mean, one of my friends is a very famous uh, author, a guy called James Smith from over in the UK. He's his PT, and he's just had his third Sunday Times bestseller. We were talking, and, and uh, someone asked him about um, how would you spend your life, or what is it that you want to do with your life? And he says, well, you know, I've got all of these books, and once you sell one, you kind of got to write another, and then you keep going and keep going and keep going. And some days I just think I'm going to sack it all in, buy a small Brazilian jiu-jitsu studio on the beach and just live there with some dogs. Some days I think that that would, would be significantly better than my current life. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? And the only way out is through. I think at least twice a year we go through that cycle. Julianne and I. Well, especially I think when you hit the burnout. Kind of yeah. Feeling. You spin and you spin and you spin and then all of a sudden you're just like, what are we doing is this, this worth, like, is what we put in, is the cost of this worth whatever it is we feel at the end of the day? And we go through this cycle constantly, and somehow we tend to always pick ourselves back up off the floor, shake ourselves off, recenter, ground in, and be like, truly, like, I think it's an emotional reaction for us, but I also, outside of the experience of it, when I see a life lived in that way, like, I have a friend who's perfectly balanced, his two kids, bought a house, He's actually been working so hard and so long at a very stable job since 17. He'll be actually officially retired. He'll take his retirement package at like, I don't know, 48. His kids will be 13, 14. He'll be a retired dad. Yep. He's happier than anyone I know. Yep. And that, if that's a path to happiness, like, and here we are like running and running and running in this hamster wheel. Yep. I have so much like admiration and it's not because of like, oh, he's so simple and I'm so complex. It's just literally, it's like, fuck, he's happy. Yeah. Like, and Chop then wood, I, carry water, man. What's that? Chop wood, carry water. Sure. So, uh, Ryan Holiday has just bought a ranch out here, famous stoicism author and whatnot. And another friend bought one five doors down from him, big ranch. And I was talking to him and I was going, uh, it's interesting because Ryan, Ryan has got all of these different things he could do. And I understand that having a ranch is, it requires a lot of work and, and he's not going to pay some people to go and look after it for him. He doesn't seem like that kind of a guy. And my friend mentioned, oh, we've got to put some fen po fence posts in this week because something blew them down or they broke or whatever. And the first thought in my mind was, I want to hit fen po fence posts into the ground. I want to come. I was thinking, hang on a second. He spent all of this time creating this very elaborate life with all of these different things. Mm -hmm. And then given the opportunity, you want to choose the least skilled, yeah. free, unpaid labor. Not because you want to signal how virtuous you are. You're not going to put it on Instagram mm -hmm. because there is something in you that realizes that a simple job done well has value. And I, I think that you're perfectly correct. The question to ask yourself is, am I overcomplicating this? For sure. Am I overcomplicating the route that I see from where I am now to where happiness is going to be? Well, at the end of the day, we're all just dust. Like... And how you spend your time is everything and how you feel during that time. And so you're the overcomplication of like the purpose, like you said, Heidi, like purpose is such a strong word. And it's like, it overcomplicates a life. Sometimes I think I, I, I don't get me wrong. What we do, not a day goes by for us either. Where I don't feel fucking so blessed. And I think we know we would do this if we weren't able to travel to Austin, make podcasts or go around the world and shoot really beautiful yoga videos and all the stuff that everyone sees. It's not even about that. It's like, there's a deeper thing in this that f I think fuels us. And it's like, it's, 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 and we preserve it and nurture it so carefully because we don't want to overcomplicate it. And when we do, it's when we get all emotional and yes. all of a sudden it's like, oh, why are we doing this? Oh, we should just sell everything and just start a, you know, an animal sanctuary. Like that's usually our go-to. Like, and it's just, we just want to be around dogs at the end of the day. Like, and I want to chop some wood and build a little house and like go to the beach for a swim in the morning. And like, it's, and that, then I'm just like, oh, but there's that thing that we, we, I feel so special that we're able to, mm. to, to preserve right now. So it's a question, I think, a lot about how much you're leaving on the table. You know, that would be something that would be in your mind. Mm. How much uh, unfulfilled potential have I got that I'm just 
running yeah, away yeah. for no reason. And then there's the inevitable cultural conditioning that you are your successes, right? So there's this interesting story from Alanda Botton that did the School of Life. And um, he talks about the change lexically over the last 2,000 years or so about people who had not done well in life. So in ancient Greece, they would refer referred to them as the unfortunates. Lady Fortuna hadn't blessed them. So you've seen Fortuna, she's the goddess, and she's got, I think she's got the scales. Yeah, the scales. And the reason that she's got the scales is because in ancient Greece, people realized that sometimes things are good and sometimes things are bad, but the scales usually end up balancing. And you don't know the pains that people, even the ones that are very admirable, have to pay in order to get there. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that some people don't start with head starts in life, but the change lexically went from the unfortunate someone that was born with one leg or into a bad family or that was homeless and on the street or whatever to 2022 now it's a loser mm. right you're a loser you've lost at the game and i'm a winner at the game mm. because in a meritocracy if the people who succeed are worthy of their successes what does that mean the people that fail are they're worthy of their failures and that um degree of focus on the individual, individual responsibility and agency for many, many people is something that they need to hear more of. This is Jordan Peterson's message. This is Jocko Willink's message, right? People that have been on the show. If people want to check that out, we can link that in the show notes nice. below. Yeah, They're both sure. great episodes on, on modern wisdom. And um, that's their message. However, for some people, that's correct. That's what they need to hear. The people that have got victim culture and are shouting about problems that aren't problems at the moment, they need to hear, you need to take responsibility for this. There are two types of people that I can see that that's not for, though. One of them are me and my friends. I take responsibility for stuff that isn't already my responsibility. I have way, I'm crushed under the weight of responsibility. I need less. I need to be able to let go. And on the other side of that are people that are in such bad situations that they need a helping hand to get out of them. Mm -hmm. They need somebody to come in. It's like, look, if you're, especially in the US, if you're um, homeless, then it's going to be difficult to get a job. There's no national health service like we have in the UK to sweep you up if you've got mental problems. Then if you start taking drugs, that makes your mental problems worse, which ingrains you further into homelessness. Mm. And then that means you're going to, not going to get a job. And yeah. there you go. You're into the system. And that we, we drive past and say, why is there all of this? these tents under this yeah. overpass and things like that. And I, I catch myself saying it and I go, well, do you think these people chose this? Yeah, right. Is it annoying? Yeah, but God, come on. Uh, so my point being that you have a group of people that is probably the majority of the bell curve that need to take more responsibility. But then you have some people who take too much and need to dial it back and chill out. And then you have some people that just need a helping hand. And this is one of the things you asked about, a, a common thread that I've come to believe about yeah. a lot of the people that I've spoken to. One of them is about my interpretation, which is that hard and fast rules almost never work for everybody. There are pretty much no universalities when it comes to laws because we're also idiosyncratic. Yes. Now you can say every single sentence should be caveated with on average. On average, most people need to eat less sugar and have more protein in their yeah. diet. On average, people need to go to bed at the same, you know. Right. On average, people need mm -hmm. to take more responsibility for their actions, but probably not me and probably not homeless people too. Mm -hmm. When you speak about the people that are looking to kind of take a little bit of less responsibility, and, and for us actually personally, it's been something we've been really, even though we haven't really done that, there have been more things coming into our life, but we're also always looking ways to simplify. And when we're looking at the simplification, I also feel like the pandemic and COVID, when it happened, it really forced people to evaluate and reevaluate their lives. And we noticed that so many people started to kind of find a way to simplify their life and come back into nature, even like with Austin here, like how many people we've met, they're like, yeah, during the pandemic, I moved to Austin, I moved to Austin. Yes, maybe because of certain rules in terms of, you know, what was happening politically Legislation, and legislations yeah. and things like that. But also I find that like, are moving closer to nature like even the town that we live in costa rica it's like a small little surf town like the amount of americans and canadians that have migrated into this tiny little surf town and just boomed it to a whole new level it's like there is this search for simplicity and reconnection with nature but also through that reconnection of nature reconnection with themselves and their own spirit and their own soul and, you know, and something that I have seen here in Austin, and I'm just kind of reflecting on our last two weeks here from meeting so many people and 
kind of seeing the scene is that a lot of people are diving into this deep connection of spiritualism. But to a point where at times I notice that it's almost becoming like a fashion a little bit. <laughs> Can't. You must not discover the ruthless <laughs> underbelly of Austin's performative <laughs> spiritual community. No, it's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. I, 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 it's just... It's... They're going to come for you now. They're going to come for you. Even no, had a cold plunge. Uh, I have got a cold plunge. You're right. I mean, I, I turned up in... <laughs> Crocs and socks, so Austin fully has me now. Um, <laughs> you, you're super correct, though, right? I mean, you guys will have heard of spiritual bypass or spiritual tourism, mm -hmm. people that decide that they're going to go to Colombia or the Amazon rainforest and take a high dose of ayahuasca simply to come back and tell people about their peak experience and never integrate it. And then mm -hmm. they'll go again in six months' time, and they'll go again in There's six months' time. There's many people in Costa Rica like that. Yes. Yeah, Costa Rica is going through the and same it's, plague, And too. it's going through that plague. It's yeah. a pandemic of that. Well, think about... The advantage that you have there, you get to experience a you know spiritually enlightening peak state for however long may feel like an infinity. You get to tell everybody else about it, so it becomes part of your uh, identity mm -hmm. when you come back. You don't actually have to do the hard work of working out how does all of that stuff relate to me now when I'm sober. How do I integrate that into my life? Integration. Yeah. Spiritual bypass and the performative, uh, performative psychedelic uh, tourism, I think, and, and also performative spirituality is a really dangerous thing because people can convince themselves of this as well. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, some people are playing a game and they know that they are. Other people genuinely believe the lie that they've managed to convince themselves mm -hmm. of and that adopts many more people into the, the same process. It's one of the reasons why I'm incredibly delicate about which people I spend my time with because it's super seductive. Yeah, yeah. Very, very seductive. For someone that's introspective and likes understanding their own mind to think that all it takes is this trip to this shaman oh, or this Lucian. particular kundalini sequence or this particular breathwork teacher or mm -hmm. whatever it is this particular book bro you've got to you've got to read this book it totally changed you know i don't i don't tell lies anymore because i read this thing it's like oh, wow i mean if that book did that then fantastic but mm -hmm. it seems to me like the sort of thing it's the same reason that um getting your neck adjusted by a chiropractor doesn't really seem to make long lasting changes it's like mm -hmm. look there is something that it can do over an acute period of time. Mm. But what is it that actually forms that? What's well, all of the structures and the habits and the routines and the patterns around that? That's physical. And this is the same when it comes to mental or psychological. That's amazing. That's kind of how you found your way through it. And, and it's good that you can kind of see. It's a prophylactic to uh, psychedelic and uh, spiritual tourism. Yes. <laughs> no, but it's it, just it, one glamour, right? It's, it, is. it becomes like a glamour a bit. Oh, absolutely. I myself have drank a lot of ayahuasca in other circumstances, and I, I'm really stunned by this. I wouldn't be able to say, like, oh, I'm going to do this again in six months. No. Like, do they come back and have such... What well, kind of experience do I they have? I think the psychedelic component is well of ayahuasca, right? Like, I've, I've never drank it either, so I can't speak to mm -hmm. the experience of it. But um, I just see it the way... I feel like it's such a sacred medicine right yes, it came from exactly. the jungle the amazon like like i've seen the history of it and they said like right like before i became a fashion like it used to be done by tribes and it was the shamans or the elders that would drink the ayahuasca and then the tribes would gather around in a circle and they would actually watch and listen and sing and just to see what's coming through the shaman it wasn't that every single person was drinking it and going through that experience but now it's shifted that, you know, Western minds, all of us that are not living in the Amazon, integrated in nature completely, 100%, we're all going there, which is fine. Again, like, I, I'm not to sound like I'm saying it's, it's a terrible thing. I don't think it is. I think there is a lot of healing that people can find whenever it's appropriate for that person's situation. But what bothers me, and I can speak honestly about it, is the way it's being misused and offered like it's a freaking shot. candy or a shot of whatever, you a know? silver bullet. A like, silver bullet, and it's hurting people. Yeah. And we've personally seen a lot of friends hurt by it. And I think that's why there's a little bit of that passion comes through. But, you know, it's just like, it was funny. And I think something that really hit me, we we were had a really wonderful conversation with Aubrey Marcus. And he was telling us the story of how his friend, um, I can't remember, some football player. Um, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, yes. Rogers. And so they they celebrated this thing. And he said, apparently, as they're celebrating, they, like, they a pulled touchdown. A, a touchdown. They started pouring ayahuasca 
in the middle in the of the end zone. In the end zone and drinking ayahuasca and like celebrating with it. And it, to me, it was like, whoa, <laughs> this is crazy that like it's being used in this sort of method. And, and okay, awesome. But that was just like a big shift for me to realize like how mainstream it's become. And it's a little worrisome to me because I'm just like, wow, it's it's becoming a fashion again, but should we should be a little bit more careful maybe with something that's supposed to really like go deep into your It psyche. seems like uh, f for Aaron, it's been an unbelievable performance enhancer. He got yeah, MVP yeah. last year. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? You think it's the ayahuasca? Or just I have no <laughs> idea. Well, I mean, this is the question that all of the commentators are talking about, right? right. It's like every, anytime that he touches the ball and does something good at the moment, it's the first place that they go to. Do they really? Kind of. Like, it's just, it's, it's sort of an in joke at the moment. Right, they're talking right. about how, oh, Aaron must have had his mushrooms this morning. Um, <laughs> because he's kind of become a poster child for the, the psychedelic bro right. in mm -hmm. a way. Um, but I think my, I'm good mates with Aubrey and based on what I know about him, he, he takes the integration stuff pretty seriously, oh, which, yeah. I, which I respect. Yeah. Um, the problem being that that's the unsexy hard work that people don't see. What right. they do see is the cool selfie with Aaron Rodgers in front of a, a big jungle. And you go, look, that that really is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. It's like saying you want to have a million subscriber YouTube channel. You know, you have to make videos. Hmm. Oh, I thought I just got it. No, 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 no. There is you a, have to keep making them too. There is a process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. play the algorithm, yeah. Right. Infinitely. Yeah. Oh, my God. No, that, I mean, that I... It's a fascinating thing because I mean I haven't done it either. We, but, neither. Um, we might be the only people in Austin, in Austin right? That <laughs> like right here. <laughs> Actually, no. Sky has anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's so I try I try really hard to just stay open to it. But I think what, what what's interesting to me what Juliana says is I think there's a lot of talk of the benefits, but there's very little talk of the negatives. Hmm. And there are, it's apparent to us just through people we know. Um, that it, it, it's a dangerous thing. It's, and if it is a medicine, like we don't all just run and take medicine all the time. Like it's very specific. And I, that integration is so lost because of that, because it seems so glamorized. Right. And it's scary to me because I like, I worry about like someone who sees Aaron Rodgers doing it. Like what if our son sees it later in life? And he's like, Oh, like, football MVP he took his mushrooms today and like and it does something and it switches the, the the potential that he could reach or the the experience of life and that the, and the joy and the happiness I'm not saying it might not enhance it either but it is an active conscious choice to pick up the dice and roll them and I don't think enough people think about the fact that it is about picking up a dice and rolling it because that you're you're playing with the wiring of your brain we're playing with like different perspectives and and so I, you know again I'm not being an alarmist at all like anyone could do whatever they want as adults, like whatever you want to put and, in your and body, it works it's totally for some cool. People, you know? And it totally yeah, works for it, some people. It heals a lot of people. But it's shadow a, it's, work too, but when, you know? Yeah, it's right? In the sh you're in the shadows and there's a kind of thing of introspection as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the end, when it becomes a sexy thing, you know, a thing to like, you know, we come from Nassara, wow. Costa Rica. I don't know if you've been to Nassara, but it's like, it's the tropical Austin and Austin is kind of, and then Tulum, Tulum is like yeah. the Mexican Nassara. Have you been to Tulum before? And so yes. there's like, yeah, I went to Tulum this summer. Yeah. How was your experience in Tulum? Fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. Into the jungle gym, did all of the touristy things. Yeah, yeah. Did all of the white people stuff. The white, <laughs> what's the white people stuff? Well, just all of the places that you get good Instagram photos, you know, the <laughs> did, smoothie bar, the yeah. gym made of wood, all did that. Did you go to Mystica? Yes. That, that was cool. Yeah. That was really, really cool. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Is that really cool? Did you uh, do any sound healing there? You know, that dome? Did you see it? In Mystica? Oh no, that's why I'm confusing it with Holistica. Oh yeah, There's that's very similar. So similar. Because yeah, they've got the branding down, haven't they? No, I didn't do that. I did do that. <laughs> Mystica was really Yeah, Mystica was, cool. oh my God. There's this one place called Holistica in Tulum, which is like a yoga vegan restaurant kind of all thing. But they have this really cool giant dome. That's all like you come in and it's filled with this mirrors and the acoustics of it is like unbelievable. So if you do any kind of sound healing there, it's like very cool. It's yeah. really magnified. So if you ever go again, you should definitely check out Holistica advertising for Holistica. <laughs> oh my goodness, right? <laughs> and, and get a that. hat. And get a Tulum hat. Oh my god, a Tulum hat. <laughs> Tulum hat. Heidi showed up at our house one day with this purple hat and it was just like, you know, in the in the like this the Tulum starter kit memes. I've seen the Austin starter kit memes. I have no but it idea. always says like it always includes have a cool hat. Yeah, the fedora <laughs> with a feather in the side of it. <laughs> right? And she walked in, we're like, you have a Tulum hat. Yeah, that was so shocking to me. I just thought I had a purple hat. I had no idea it was a branding for a city. <laughs> <laughs>
crazy. It was really, yeah. But it's really interesting just to see like how the shift of, you know, like Austin and like we're saying also like this small town that we live in in Costa Rica, how this idea of self-care, but also like the spiritualism is really expanding. And I think it's a good thing because at least it's connecting people deeper to themselves and to their hearts. It's just that like, sometimes I wonder, I'm like, okay, what's going to be the next fad? You know mm. what I mean? Like now it's, you know, this, but then it's slowly, tra you know, transforms into something else, into something else. So it's like, are we going to be continuing to deepen that medicine? Are we going to be continuing to, you know, go further into the... Kind of just shattering in all yeah. amazing directions. I think it goes to what you're saying about the diversity of people. Everyone's finding mm -hmm. something to get really focused on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually it just turns into like some kind of subculture of like, a f you know, social phenomenon of some sort. It's really interesting. And though. like for you being, a, you know, in this community, have you felt like a pressure to be trying these plant medicines? Like you said, you've never done ayahuasca. Yeah, um, not really a pressure. Mm -hmm. I think after you get past the age of... 30 or so people stop trying to peer pressure you unless you've got like silly friends i'm going to peer pressure you into doing anything yeah, yeah. and i've served my time partying right i was a club promoter for 15 years right. so i've done my time on the in the trenches yeah. of the party world um but there is uh, i guess simply through desire reflected desire i see mm -hmm. somebody that values something and i take that value on myself and it's difficult for me to work out is this mine is this just me reflecting theirs mm -hmm. a person of higher status or more interest or mm -hmm. whatever just somebody that i respect like i have to partition that out i have to make sure that it's me doing it for my reasons but no not not particularly i think it's interesting to think about what the next movement with regards to wellness and self-care is going to be yeah mm -hmm. One interesting trend that I've noticed is since Andrew Huberman has come on the scene, the biohacking community feels so hokey in comparison, I think. Mm -hmm. The sun red light therapy on the balls and the perennium sunning and the... Is this a thing? I don't know. I see it on Instagram. I don't know I if it's actually legit. This one yet. I, I the red light this on the ball. Red light on the balls is is legit. It's supposed I, I did, to. I did this. I did see a sunning one too. There's like this photo of guy doing like happy baby pose, which I don't know if you know what that is. Uh, yep, I know what it is. Like naked to the sun. To the sun. To the yeah. Sun. And I was like, wow, to the sun. <laughs> wow. Well, you've got it. I imagine as a as a as a gentleman with your faculties still intact, you're actually going to have to. You're going to have to fold up as yeah, well, right? That's right. There's or are you going to cast a shadow? There's going to be an under testicle shadow <laughs> that you're going to have to avoid. You, you have to tuck it under. That's right. Um, <laughs> but I do think that um, if you look at someone like Huberman who's come in, very science-based, very evidence-based, what do the journals say? I, I think that that has been a fantastic move. I think that that was something that was very much needed, and it's shown in the fact that it's been so popular. Mm -hmm. And he's a good friend, and he, he's really, really... He genuinely cares about science. He signs Amazing. off all of his things with yeah. thank you for your interest in science. That's how he sees it. And um, I think that was needed because in every industry, I'm sure in yours as well, there are uh, evidence-based principles and there is speculation. And speculation is a lot more sexy because it's quicker and cooler and has a hat or whatever. And the <laughs> version of... Uh, training, diet, exercise, mood regulation, sleep regulation, all of that stuff that's based in evidence, mm. for me is what's been very seductive. So I think since getting to Austin, I've seen a side of uh, wellness and health that's been more on that side. So I'll be going and doing sauna, ice bath, getting up at the right time, flow state sports like a pickleball or something like that, and utilizing those things. Now, it's different flavors. There are people that would see sound healing, yoga, uh, breath work, not that I don't do any of these things, but that that would be their uh, main focus of wellness, right? And the fact that you have this multiplicity now is is cool because it allows people to, to choose. Yeah. Now, going back to something we said at the very beginning that relates to this, we're talking about all of the different life paths that you've got and people can't be everything they want. They have to choose the thing they want to be. Mm -hmm. Barry Schwartz's The Paradox of Choice, you ever see that? It was a TED talk from about 15 years ago absolutely legendary so. so anyone can go and check this out and um he's talking about how 30 or 40 years ago if you went into a department store to get a pair of jeans there's one pair of jeans it's like what size are you okay there's your jeans mm. whereas now if you're to go in it's okay do you want boot cut or skinny cut do you want ripped do you want stonewashed do you want black do you want faded do you want cropped what size waist are you what size leg are you and you get overwhelmed and the argument from economists has always been that 
the more options you have, the closer that you can accurately get the outcome that you want represented in the real world. If you wanted a very specific pair of jeans and you go in and you find the exact thing, it's closer to your optimizing function, which gives you more utility, right, in, in mm. economist speak. But what you find is that people get paralysis by analysis mm -hmm. and they go in and they struggle to make choices. And also after they do make a choice, they feel worse about that choice because there were so many other options that they could have had Except and loss aversion. Yeah. yeah. Loss aversion is such a big deal for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. So I do wonder sometimes about the level of complexity that we're adding into the world and whether it would be better mm -hmm. bizarrely to have fewer wellness practices. Mm -hmm. right. whether the fact that anybody can create a course on Teachable or Kajabi in a weekend mm -hmm. and then say there's another modality thrown out into the world, you know, and with the, enough reach, that could be a, a genuinely popular modality. And right. it might have tons of, of uh, veracity and science to back it up, or it might not. Mm -hmm. But the more things that you add in, I feel like the less likely someone is to stick to a single program, which you guys will know is, you know, one of the most important things is just doing the thing. Yeah. over and over again uh and also it's going to make people feel worse about whatever modality it is that they do choose because mm -hmm. you're going to think about all of the other things that they could be doing instead oh, should i be doing breath work instead of sound healing should i be doing ice bath instead of going for a morning walk you're missing out a little bit too because it's like well is this something better am i missing out on a on a better oh thing for me because yeah like when you have too many options it's like the Netflix problem, right? Yeah, you can like sit there literally. and just scroll and be like, what should I find? It's so silly. And then you turn something on and 10 minutes later you turn it off because you're like, well, it Not just doesn't enough. live up to that expectation. Well, you you see this in the dating world as well. You yeah. know, there's a, I had Logan Yuri, who is the director of relationship science at Hinge, the dating app. Huh. I had her on the show and she calls these people maximizers, people mm. who are constantly looking to have 10 out of 10 out of 10 on everything. My partner needs to be my best friend and my sexual concubine and my confidant and my therapist and my business partner and my homeowner and da, 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 like everything, right? Yeah. Needs to be absolutely everything on all of them. I don't disagree that the fact that people aren't restricted to the five mile radius around their farm is mm -hmm. a bad thing. Like mm -hmm. it's good that people have more right. choices For than sure. simply yeah. the, the two farms either side of them and their mm -hmm. terrible sons with no teeth or terrible <laughs> daughters with bad breath or whatever, right? Like that's, that is good. But it does seem to be leading to greater relationship dissatisfaction. And mm -hmm. you see this borne out in uh, Indian arranged marriages that people who have never met each other before get put into a marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, divorce rate in the Indian community is like 4% or less. You go, okay, so what you're saying is that proximity can breed familiarity, which can breed love. So you put people together, they have to work together on mm -hmm. a thing. They both come into it at the same stage. Um, but there is a, a question to be asked. There's a, a justifiable well, question to be asked. Well, most people don't know is actually they go see, um, they do consent, you know, so they, they meet and they actually go see like an astrologer and they see how compatible that they are. Oh. Astrologer, that's with, uh, uh -huh. with, with like the moon, which is like who you are. Maybe that's what inside. we're missing. Maybe I wonder whether Hinge and Tinder should just put. Well, actually, <laughs> I once went on a dating app. It was called Bumble, and there you had the astrological sign of the person. And I realized I was just doing scientific research. Like, what does this person look like? Okay, is this the threats of? So I, I got rid of it. But it's really <laughs> interesting with these arranged marriages that I've seen this. Uh, I think it was on Netflix this series, and I was like, okay, it was really confirmed. Like they look at the chart. Like, are these people gonna live happily together at the long in the long term? And then. Yeah. Very interesting. It's very interesting. Do you think you can look at someone's astrological sign or chart and you can tell if they're going to be able to be compatible? So not their sign. So they use points of the moon. The moon is who you are deep inside, who you are at night when no one is watching. You know, hmm. It's your inner self. It's your true identity, your instinctual identity. So they go off that and... Yeah, I don't know the specific system of that. I'm not a Vedic astrologer, but it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. because you'll feel at home with that person. Right. But it's interesting that people set up these expectations, like you're saying, with these dating apps, right? So they see photos. I've never been on a dating app. I really don't fully know how it all works. But it's like, I guess you see photos and all the descriptions about people like Facebook. So they build up this expectation. And then they actually meet the person. And I mean... Is it an expectation thing? Or is it when they meet them, they now they don't really fit the bill? 
But it's like, kind of like the story that Chris was saying, you know, you go into this holiday and you have all these things. I'm going to have this drink and it's going to be like this and we're going to eat this kind of food. Mm. And it's like, do we apply that same mentality to dating? Not to the individual person, I don't think. So no. I don't think that you, yes, across the entire dating realm itself. Mm -hmm. So you're going to say, I have window shopped a thousand people. I have seen all of these opportunities. You can see as a man, more women in one afternoon than you would see in your lifetime right. ancestrally, right? right? So you are not used to this level of stimulation uh, and exposure mm -hmm. and it skews your understanding of what it is that you want, what it is that you should get. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think that there is a question to be asked around whether people's people just need to learn to commit and make things work from that way. But there's also a, a brutal other side to that, which is if it's not a hell yes, then it's a no. I think mm -hmm. that that really seems to be the mm. way that you should look at relationships. If it's not a hell yes, what are we doing here? Right. If you've got kids, if you've got financial responsibilities, yeah, yeah. blah, 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 caveat, caveat. But when you're meeting someone, it's like, if it's not a hell yes, then it's probably a no. And there's this need though for partnership, well, not feeling like, like lonely, which is interesting. Though. People are lonely in this world, and especially since the pandemic, too, when people have been even more separated, more isolated. You think it's loneliness, though? But could it not also... Loneliness for a connection. I think that's what it is. Like, why... It's not just... I don't think it's just sexual. Maybe for some people, but it's, it's oh, not a connection sexual. that people are, like, missing with another human being. Right. Yeah. Or maybe not being... Like, what is... You know, loneliness is an interesting thing, and I'd love to hear what you have to say, because I think there's a lot... You do a lot of... Like from what I've seen on YouTube, there's a lot of relationship that you have looked at. Um, and so how much of that like loneliness do you think is them just not being happy with who they are to be alone? Meaning that they're looking for someone to fill something they could fill themselves. Or is there that DNA in us that's looking for a mate and, and feels inadequate because we don't have a mate rather than something that they could fulfill in just maybe a more purpose for life or being okay with their thoughts alone? Yeah. Um, again, this is the, there will be multiple buckets of people that that applies to and doesn't. Yeah, yeah. I would course. say at the moment, on average, most <laughs> people are spending too much time away from other people. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. the most common answer to the question, who do you have to call on that's a friend in a time of desperate need? The most common answer in America is zero. That's not the average or the mean, but mm -hmm. yeah. it's the most zero? common. Zero is the most common answer. More people had zero than had any other particular answer. Did you say, in a, do you think that's in America? Or Correct. You, so Western culture or just America? And you're just, I would obviously. Guess, I would guess that the loneliness epidemic, you're seeing it across the UK as well. Most Western countries that would have been exacerbated by COVID, definitely by a distance. But this was locked in before COVID. I was having conversations about this two years ago. So I think that the opportunity to stay in the house and get fake signals of fitness and reassurance, ambition, drive, sexual gratification, all from the internet, mm -hmm. permits people to live a much less happy life, but one that avoids rejection and misery. Mm -hmm. So you can, as a young guy, you can play um, Valorant or League of Legends or Call of Duty, and it gives you community it gives you the sense of progression it channels your ambition that you would have put into a job or something in the real world it channels that into a computer game okay mm -hmm. well there's one part of like what men typically do that's yeah, looked yeah. after then porn manages to fill fake uh signals of fitness reproductive fitness mm -hmm. there's a paper by diana fleischman called uncanny vulvas which talks about how porn might be feeding us these um fake signals of reproductive fitness one of the questions is if there's so many unhappy, disaffected young men, which there are, the number of men between 18 and 30 reporting no sex in the last year has tripled from 8% to 28% uh, over the last decade, right? So nearly 30%. And this was 2018, this stopped. So you've got another four years, including the pandemic. Including it wouldn't COVID. surprise me if it was 50%. Wouldn't surprise me if 50% of men aged between 18 and 30 report no sex in the last year. If that's the case, why haven't we got roving bands of disaffected young men getting together like gangs of London or gangs of New York and just pushing over granny and causing havoc? That's a really interesting question. It's called young male syndrome, right? There's this, uh, a lot of 
societies and civilizations before their fall have had an imbalance between young available men and women that they can partner with in gerontocracies where the uh, older guys are the only ones that are allowed to mate with the younger women you also see the same fault that's why they don't stick about because they're too instable but we haven't seen that mm -hmm. where are all of the young men mm. but they're there and they're misogynistic or or, or whatever online shit posting online and yes. doing their things like don't get me wrong it pushes people into some dangerous corners of the internet but there's no activation energy mm -hmm. i'm not seeing anything kinetic happening in mm. the real world. And I think that the concern was that we were going to have young men that were going to cause a bang in society. And instead it looks like it's going to be a fizzle. Mm. Huh. What do you think the outcome of that's going to be? You seen Surrogates, the film with Bruce Willis? No. So it's in the set in the far future and kind of like this. Everybody's concerned about the dangers of being in the outside world. And then you get an avatar type robot character and you sit on your couch and you get IV'd uh, the nutrients that you need and you live your life through a robot that looks like you but is much better looking and never ages and whatever, whatever. And I worry that we move toward a stage where people mistake a comfortable activity for an enjoyable activity more and more. Mm. Right. That's the conflation. That's the fundamental conflation, I think. Um, I don't want to fear rejection of a girl in a bar mm -hmm. so I can use porn at home. I don't want to fear sexual assault of a guy in a bar so I can, I don't know what girls do, whatever they get up to. Uh, <laughs> my point being that there are a number of ways to take a significantly less enjoyable, but even more less risky mm -hmm. approach huh. that permits you to move through life. And this is where the take more responsibility, do hard things. Yeah, I have a bunch of friends who do not need to do harder things. They need to do easier things. Mm -hmm. They make life too hard for themselves. Mm -hmm. They take on too much responsibility. That's not these people. These people are the ones that need to take more responsibility. But what about that discomfort? It obviously, like saying, making the choice of comfort can be such a negative in the outcome. Um, how, do, like, and you seem to enjoy discomfort because it seems to push you, you taking on the responsibility. How do you convince someone or, or how do you bring that forward? In a, you know, on a platform like this to explain the value of that. I can uh, cerebrally, cognitively explain it, but the best thing that you could do is to get a bro or a girlfriend and say, we're going to spend the next six months making ourselves as good as we can be. Hmm. And we're going to learn together. We're going to fail together. We're going to do all of these things. And this is, comes back to the loneliness conversation. Uh, the challenge that you have of doing anything that's new is made... I would say by a factor of 10 easier if you have some external accountability that's a friend. I've trained in the gym for 15, 17 years or something like that now. Even now when I go in the gym, if I'm with my housemate or with someone else that's a training partner, my training sessions are at least 30% to 50% better, right? That's so but interesting. Why is that the accountability is the component for you? Why because do you because you've always got to get out of jail free card. You've always got to, ah, uh, you know, I've done <laughs> right. enough. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. done a whatever. Uh, and you need the drill sergeant in your mm -hmm. I don't want to look like a pussy in front of my friend. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to yeah. lift the weight. Yeah. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to press it. Right. And he's there encouraging you and you're yeah. having conversations and you're not in your head. Mm -hmm. You're not neurotically looking at yourself in the mirror while you're doing the whatever. Like getting in the ice bath. I got in the ice bath yesterday. I haven't used it at my house for a little while because I was back in the UK and I got in yesterday and it, about 45 seconds, I was hating it. I really, mm. really, really wanted to get out. My boy had just got in. I'm like, I'm, I'm not getting out while he's here. If he hadn't been there, it would have been a lot harder. And he's wittering on about some <laughs> bullshit to do with some new rock band or something. I don't know what he's talking about. And I'm just there thinking, shut up, shut up. <laughs> but I knew that he was there and he was there supporting me. And, and, and that's what you do. I think practical things. This is one... Um, consideration i think a lot of people that do podcasts should try and rely on um we can pontificate about bro science all we want about this is why this thing might be in blah 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 does it grow corn like tell me mm -hmm. what you've learned and how to apply that to my life like mm -hmm. what can i do get a partner that you can work with on self-development for the remainder of the year mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like, i don't know when this is going to go out but the remainder of next year if it comes mm -hmm. out next year you have the opportunity to look back on the next three months of your life. At the end of that three months, what would have had to have happened for you to look back and consider it a success? You can choose anything, anything you want. 
what would it be? Would you have lost five pounds? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the thing. Find a person, any person, even if it's a person on the internet, it would be better if it was in real life, person that's on the internet and say, hey man, I, I really want to make a, a, a big change mm -hmm. in my life. Do you want to, why don't we do this together? Why don't we be training partners or accountability buddies or whatever? Um, when it comes to cognitively understanding why discomfort's good for you, it's that discomfort is coming for you whether you want to have it or not. There is chosen and unchosen discomfort in life, right? Mm. Chosen discomfort are the things that allow you to work on your capacity so that when unchosen discomfort arrives, you're ready for it. You know, you're going to die. One day, the phone is going to ring and it's going to be somebody that you care about. And you're not going to get to speak to them anymore. You're going to be the person that has to deal with their funeral arrangements. You're going to have to be the person that tells their kid. You need to be ready for that. Jordan Peterson says, be the guy that can uh, stand up and give a speech at your father's funeral. I love that, that speech that he that's so that was powerful, yeah. you are going to face suffering and pain and discomfort, strife, loneliness, all of these things. The more that you can callous your mind, as Goggins says, mm. the more that you can callous your mind against this stuff by electing to do hard things, the more that you're going to be ready when it happens. Because it's coming for you. Mm -hmm. It's coming for you. And only in the times when things are good can you work out how to push your tolerance of when things are going to be bad. Which is strange. It's a strange no, paradox, right? It's a strange paradox, but it's so valuable. And I like that you said, how can you actually sort of bring it down to a level that people that are listening can actually just understand it and actually do something. Because yep. so many people love to talk and talk about it at these high sort of like esoteric levels. Of like yeah. How, yeah, like how to optimize your life and be the best. But it's like, just go out and make a decision. Do a thing. Just do a thing. And get uncomfortable. Like, and un and it, everything comes through uncomfort. And that's, it, that's where you get the real growth, right? Is, is when you're in that uncomfortable state where you have to dig a little bit deeper and find that strength. Stand up at your father's funeral and actually ugh. talk and make a speech and make arrangements when all you want to do is just crawl mm. away and cry your eyes out, right? It's, it's like it's rising above. Mm. That the level. one that they turn to you, that you keep yeah. it together. When he, the first time I heard Jordan Peterson say that, that was it was so just powerful. the most, it was an, like an astounding moment in my life. You know, like it's, it actually like one of those things where it just goes and just it's something that like lasts in your brain because anytime then you face a hard moment, it's like it just kind of whispers in your ear like that yeah. that speech and what that you're doing it for yeah that experience and I always look back like I used to be a, a rhythmic gymnast professionally like most of my life till I was seventeen. I had a really abusive uh, Eastern European coach, and you know she would. And I remember there's one thing that she would say when, you know, she'd yell at us and hit us and all those things and you'd be on the floor and she's just yelling at you like, get up, get up, get up. And I remember there was this moment when she said, the strength that you build right now to get off the floor when your body is tired, when you've been training for eight hours, when you're hungry, when you're thirsty, that strength that develops is what's going to carry you in life in the next moments when you're an adult and when you're having to face other real life situations. And it's crazy because in the moment when I heard that I hated her and I was, you know, 16 year old girl, just like, okay, like fuck what's, you. <laughs> what's that? Like, fuck you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but now when I look back, I'm like, she was right. Because now even in those moments when it's really difficult in life, I think about that strength that it took me to get up off the floor in that moment when she was yelling at me. Mm. I get off the floor in other moments in my life now. It, it, like, it sat in me and I was uncomfortable and it was painful and I was hurting. And so it's like, it's thinking about in those moments in our life that we reach when we feel like you're at the rock bottom even. It's like, are you going to get up or are you going to sink? So I think that you're right that when people hit rock bottom, it, it can be bad. Mm -hmm. I would argue that there is a place that's even worse than that. Really? So... There's an idea called the zone of comfortable complacency, right? Uh, and this is where you are sedated against things being too bad, mm -hmm. but you're also not so bad that you bounce yourself out. It's also referred mm -hmm. to as the region beta paradox. So imagine that if you were going to go less than a mile, you would uh, walk, but if you were going to go more than a mile, you would drive. Mm -hmm. paradoxically you go two miles quicker than you go one mile right so the point is that bad situations can sometimes be less bad than 
better situations. Mm -hmm. So the friend that is in a pretty shitty job, but the benefits are okay and the boss isn't that much of a dick, so they stick about. The person that's mm -hmm. in a relationship that they're really not very happy with, but they're not that abusive and it's okay and maybe they make a good Sunday dinner, so we'll stick about with them. Or you live in an apartment and the apartment sucks and there's some mold on the ceiling, but it's not that bad and it's kind of cheap and it's whatever. The functional addict. All of these people would be better off if their lives were worse mm -hmm. because it would push them to a stage where they actually need to do something about it. Being, being able to function in those allows you to continue to function that way. Yeah, you can, yeah. that is the zone of comfortable complacency, yeah. right? You can exist in that until you die. That's being comfortably numb, right? Now, going further, getting things worse would actually be a benefit to you. And that's the stage that comfortably numb is, I think, where a lot of people find themselves. The people that are in genuine, genuine rock bottom, you, if you stay there for much longer, you're dead, right? right? So by design, you're not there for that long. Mm -hmm. like you either bounce back out of the bottom or it's game over. It's the people that are in the big bit of the bell curve that are sat in the middle, that know that there's more to life but can't work out what it is or where it is or how to get it. Mm -hmm. And especially as we said earlier on, the ones that have seen outside of Plato's cave or have opened Pandora's mm -hmm. box and they go, I know there's more. I know that I'm not supposed to be, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but I don't know how to get out of it. And that first step, I think, is what a lot of the focus has been on my show, Modern Wisdom, for quite a while, up until recently, was about activation energy. It was about going from zero to 0.1. Mm -hmm. Like, how did that begin? Right. And that, for many people, is the point that they get stuck at. I'm now more interested in getting people from 50 to 80 and from 80 to 90. Mm -hmm. That the audience appears to be growing with me, and I'm also growing with myself, that I don't have very many days anymore that I'm at zero, although I used to. Um, but that's where a lot of people get stuck. Just no momentum, no nothing. How do I get from zero to one? Do you think that first step is all about fear? Is fear the one thing that's really like stopping people from take that step from that bad but not terrible relationship? Oh God, it could be all sorts of things. Mm. Habit, uh, convenience, mm. comfort, fear of being alone. Uh, yeah, I think that fear would play a, a, a big chunk of that reason, but expectations from parents, expectations from people around them. There is a an entire society of things that can combine to stop you from becoming who you're supposed to be, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, content creators online that are putting out things that are affordable or free and help people to feel less alone, especially mm -hmm. during pandemic, was such a big deal. Mm -hmm. Right? Such a big deal. But also connect on ways that you're seeing the world as well. Because... In, in a very divisive society that we live in, sometimes it's scary to, even in your circles, to talk about a subject or a way you see life that would necessarily go against the narrative. Yep. And you see it even like when people connect, for example, to Jordan Peterson, like you brought him up. And we, we really do like resonate with a lot of his things that he speaks about. Um, and he's helped us oh my know, God, through yeah. our life. But it's, it's interesting my... how the mainstream society or mainstream media, I guess, has almost villainized Jordan Peterson. And it's like, we even noticed it once. We, we mentioned his name. I don't know where it was like a, a live stream, a live stream with our community and the amount of people like, oh, Jordan Peterson the in the same shot. sentence with Bo Beautiful. Like they were like so triggered by this man who's actually like, if you look outside of the cancel culture and what they've done to, to his name, it's like he has so much wisdom. The share. I mean, and you you had a full podcast with Jordan Peter. Two, two, yeah, right? two yeah, podcasts. Yeah, yeah. He's been on twice. I mean, he's a lightning rod for the culture war, unfortunately. He's become <laughs> Why is that? Like Because he's easy to lambast, right? He's a straight white male who's now rich and well known, talking like the patriarch that everybody dislikes at the moment. Mm. He isn't afraid to say what he thinks. Right. About people and situations sometimes to a fault sometimes i wish that he would say less like, i think it would be beneficial for his career and <laughs> for his sanity as well but it's one of the uh things that i suppose is a byproduct of what makes him great the fact that he isn't prepared to shut up about stuff mm. but yeah he he uh, simply by virtue of being so well known he has become the lightning rod for all of these culture warsy topics mm -hmm. and 
the story of Icarus. You know that, right? You fly too close to anything and mm -hmm. all sorts of craziness comes out of the woodwork. And yeah, they needed people that don't like that type of messaging or content needed a figurehead. Mm. Yes. Who's it going to be? Is it going to be Ben Shapiro? Is it going to be Joe Rogan? Is it going to be Jordan Peterson? Because it's not going to be um, the more old schooly type people like a, a Tony Robbins or whatever, right? Or a Ty Lopez or someone. They're kind of a little, they're like one half generation mm -hmm. behind in terms of their exposure. That was Facebook big. Now we're talking sort yeah. of YouTube and podcast big. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they just wanted someone that they could point the finger at. And he's, I mean, Olivia Wilde's new movie. Right. Uh, the... Don't worry, darling. Uh cast the big evil guy as based on jordan peterson yeah. incel god jordan peterson she called him said that it's this group of disaffected mostly white men it was unfortunate because one of my friends has conducted one of the biggest studies into incels on the planet and they're disproportionately represented by people of color a lot of people of color are disproportionately so in the incel community mm. so uh i wonder whether olivia feels so good about her comments knowing that she's hurting people of color now incels of color wouldn't be the sort of thing that she would want to push back against. But for as long as she can throw whatever trendy current social justice term is available at it, then she's going to do that. But I, Jordan is a very singular individual and whatever mm -hmm. it is that ends up happening, he'll be fine with. Yeah. Um, I mean, I... the guy, the guy went, we went for breakfast while, while I was in the UK a few weeks ago and he left breakfast with me to go for lunch with Cristiano Ronaldo. That was one of the greatest wow. footballers of all time. Yeah. So I, something tells me that Jordan's going to be okay. <laughs> It's interesting though, because when you talk, when you speak about like the the older generation of sort of who was there before, like the Tony Robbins kind of thing, I mean, those that generation played it very safe. And Jordan, yes. and I think what's beautiful about Jordan is if he has something to say, he says it. Um, and a lot of these topics again, you know, that speak against the woke culture and with with fire too. Like sometimes I think that anger, and I don't know him. I've never met him. I only know the avatar that i see online but i feel like the fire that is so frustrating to him because it makes so much sense and clarity is also the one that they turn around to burn him with in a way because he gets so angry sometimes like uh, he's got, yeah he's got definitely a lot of like fire in him and you see it even i remember there's this really funny one that you asked him about if you could pick an emoji that you could be what would it be i love that and, <laughs> and just and he was just like <laughs> you could just <laughs> What am I? What do you want me to say to that, Jordan? Come on now. In the pause, it was the silent appropriating emoji it. culture. Oh my goodness! Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, his uh, preparedness to speak in a way which is going to rile people up, I think, is pretty impressive. But I look at the rest of the community of people that are around him. You know, like mm -hmm. say what you want about Sam Harris. Sam does not give a single fuck about mm. what people think about him. Mm. He doesn't care what people think about him. And whether you agree with his stance on meditation or Trump or politics or anything else, yeah. I can very much admire someone that doesn't give a shit about other people. Uh, because you can probably trust that what they're saying is something that they believe. So if I know one of your opinions and from it I can accurately predict everything else that you believe, then you're probably not the serious thinker. You've probably taken your ideas wholesale from somebody mm -hmm. else, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you have this piecemeal Frankenstein's monster put together set of worldview beliefs, go, well, that sounds pretty considered. That's the first thing. And then if holding those beliefs causes you to pay an unbelievably high price publicly, mm -hmm. Why would anybody decide to hold this non-typical group of beliefs and then take a ton of shit from people online for doing so? Why mm. wouldn't you just fold? Well, the only reason that I can think of is that you have genuine personal conviction that you believe this thing that you're talking about. That's one of the reasons why I think that Sam believes the things that he says, mm. and I very much respect him for that, and I very much respect Jordan for the things mm -hmm. that he does. This doesn't get you around self-deception. Now You can be self-deceived. Right. Mm -hmm. The easiest way to spout a lie is to believe it yourself or an untruth or something uh but both of those guys are pretty well considered so mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's a, an explanation either but i think just generally as a heuristic to judge is this person telling the truth yeah what's the cost that they pay for holding this belief mm -hmm. the, the same thing happens in you'll have seen this during pride month when 
the uh, US companies all change their display photos to Pride, but the Middle Eastern versions all stay the same. Right. So BMW Abu Dhabi is still black, whereas the one that's in the US is the colors of the rainbow. Well, why is that? Well, because it's a costless signal mm -hmm. for yeah. you to be able to, we stand with people of different sexual or sexual orientations. Okay. And no one, n no one is shocked by that. Yeah. Like it, we don't care about your home. Who, who's pushing back against you doing this in the West? Very cheap signal. <laughs> it's a very expensive signal to do that in Dubai or Qatar right. or Kuwait. And that's why it's a, a cheap signal. And it just makes sense. They divide it. It's captured by both audiences in a way, correct? Which is a fascinating thing, like audience capture. Mm -hmm. um, and, Love it. Oh, oh, we talk about it a lot. We're doing this podcast. We're sitting down with people that our audience is not necessarily going to be very happy. Not all of our audience, but members of them. Sorry. <laughs> no, not you. <laughs> well, actually, these days you'd never know. I mean, you, you sat with you, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, Who knows what they're going to think Jordan about Peterson that? Tarnished. I've been right? tarnished yeah. by association. <laughs> yeah, it's very dangerous. But what, like, you're you seem you know, we've only met, but you seem a man of very strong conviction and that's very admirable. And I think even your response to the, the term audience capture, it's like, that's something to sink into. Pet project, dude. Did you read Gwinda Bogle's uh, article on the perils of audience capture? No. Uh, I'll send you the URL. And once people have listened to one of my episodes with Jordan, you can go and check this one out as well, which is a article by a friend of mine. And he is an unbelievably incisive writer. So, for the people that aren't familiar, audience capture is kind of the reverse of echo chambers for um, users online. So everybody mm -hmm. understands that when you start to consume a particular piece of content, the algorithm starts to feed you more of that content. What most people that aren't content creators don't realize is that there is a reverse version of this as well. The street, is the, it's a two-way street mm -hmm. because the creator is putting out content and they are waiting to see what lands. And over time, if you optimize, as we said earlier on, if your good hearts law your way mm -hmm. toward optimizing for views, you will continue to feed more and more red meat to your audience, which is pandering to their lowest common denominator and playing a game of becoming increasingly more predictable and probably more outlandish with um, more sort of bombastic takes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now, the problem of this is that if you start to go down that road, you will select for a very particular type of audience that you will come to hate. It's my belief that anybody that becomes audience captured over time will hate their audience mm. because they're playing they're playing a role, right? Mm. The person has been subsumed by the persona and it now, like a parasite, it stares out through their eyes, right? Mm. right? It's, it's a marionette that's just playing them and they're playing the strings. And, but outwardly, it looks amazing. You've got all of these followers <laughs> and all of these people that care about what you think. And inwardly, you're dying because you know that you're no different to Chris Hemsworth when he decides to put on the outfit of Thor and play the role. Yeah, yeah. Like, we don't love Chris Hemsworth. We love Thor. We don't mm -hmm. love yeah. Russell Crowe. We love Gladiator. And this is how you can feel alone in a crowd or hollow in victory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a distance between the person and the persona. And if you're always playing a role, you'll never feel love. You'll only feel praise, mm. right? People will applaud the work that you do, but you're never existentially connected with it because it's not you. Mm -hmm. There is always a second order buffer between you and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And with audience capture, you are fed all of the objective metrics of success that you could want and almost none of the subjective metrics of success. But you can supplant a lot of that subjective stuff well, oh, with the money and the new house and the accolade and the blue tick and the, the gold plaque from youtube and all the rest mm -hmm. of it you go well okay back to what we first said when we began what are you optimizing for mm -hmm. are you optimizing for a channel and a piece of content that you care about that you absolutely adore and the, a body of work that you're proud about or are you prepared to sell your soul, whatever the price. And that's, you know, some people do that and maybe they can be perfectly happy with it, but mm -hmm. I think far more people than think it aren't. Once you sell your integrity, you can't buy it back. Um, you will always be known by the worst comments that you've made on the internet. And you will always be known by the uh, audience that hates you the most and loves you the most. Mm -hmm. But this is why going back to the Sam Harris thing, like. If you are on the extremes of left or right, you at least guarantee agreement from one side. You're in the middle, you guarantee disagreement from both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants that subtle, could be both ways, could be whatever. Mm -hmm. Because that's someone that's, um, 
untrustworthy. If I know one of your views and I can predict everything else, I don't need to think. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what to expect from you tomorrow. It's mm -hmm. exactly what I would have expected because here's the model that you fit into, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if you're someone that is pro-life, pro-gun, small government, high tax, pro-immigration, you go, okay, well, how, what, where yeah. are we? Mm -hmm. what, Frankenstein. what is this? Yeah, precisely. Right. Yeah. Which makes you a very unreliable ally. Why would I want to ally with someone that I can't, I can't predict? No, 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 no. You don't get to be a part right. of us. So people end up being ostracized. It's a good example of this, you mentioned that I talk a lot about dating. Um, so the manosphere or the red pill world, which is this sort of corner of the internet that uses evolutionary psychology to understand dating dynamics, mostly for men. Uh, as soon as you start talking about gender roles on the internet, you get lumped in with manosphere red pill people. Mm -hmm. Like, I am not a part of that and I do not want that audience. Mm -hmm. But some of the content aligns with some of their views. And then as soon as I step away from that, as soon as I diverge and say something that they don't agree with, then they decide to castigate the person that they thought I was. Now it's just as well that I mean, I'm audience captured in a million different ways, right? But it's just as well that I've realized that I'm not for that. Because if I was getting castigated for that, it, that's the pressure, right? Mm, yeah. We don't want to listen to this woman tell us about what men want. You don't ask a fish how to fish is like a really common thing whenever you get a woman on board to talk about women's preferences. I'm like, look, if you're trying to attract women, maybe spend a fucking nanosecond thinking about how women think. Mm -hmm. um, but when that happens, if that was me being audience captured, what would the stimulus be? Mm -hmm. Don't bring any more women on. Mm. Or just talk to men because I give the audience what it wants. Right. But in the same way as you don't let the child eat ice cream every night, that that's what it wants. Mm -hmm. It's not what's good for it. Mm -hmm. but I'm going to give you what I think is good for you or mm -hmm. more technically what I think is interesting to me. And that's what you're going to have. Hmm. And how we're seeing this podcast. Yeah, for sure. This is the whole reason. You think you'll get, um, it, it seems like your audience might be uh, a little bit contentious with some very viewpoints, especially given the fact that this is you guys beginning to open up mm -hmm. about more than just how to do a good downward dog. Um, are you concerned conscious aware of the fact that you might be amputating a little bit of the audience along with this oh, project yeah. conscious but not really concerned i think what's interesting about what you're saying is that it's about um a truth and that frankenstein of beliefs that you talk about i think that's um i think each of us if we were critical thinking thinkers if we took the time to process through our beliefs would end up with your own unique perspective because we all have lived in our own unique lives. Mm -hmm. And so you build this construct of beliefs through what we've experienced. And our goal here is to intersect our truth with your truth. And to, I'm not going to, I mean, you haven't said anything I don't agree with yet, but I'm going to be open to whatever you have to present and allow it to affect my truth. And if it, me expressing a truth in any way whatsoever um, does anything to affect our audience capture, like to basically, to, to, to hurts our, our business, right? Like that's not the goal. And I think in life for us and what we've come to realize through our practice and through yoga and what we're trying to share with our audience is express your truth, like with all of your heart, but also accept others and give them the space to do the same. And you never know what kind of magic is going to happen in the process. And through that, we'll all be better off. But this fucking A, like... A, team A and team B thing, team B thing that's going on in the world right now, it has to fucking stop. Like, and from our perspective, we're yogis. Like, and I, I have a hard time putting an identity to it. Like we practice yoga, but we believe in a union. And that's all that yogis mean to me. Like we're, we literally, we believe in a union of all things. Well, yoga is union, right? But that's Like yoga is like the moon and the sun coming together. If you will look at it, it's about oneness, the mind and the body connection. But then everything we've seen, even especially in the last two years, it's been nothing but div divisiveness. Even in the yoga community, a community that's supposed to be about like coming together, accepting each other and loving each other for all different views that we see life as. There's nothing but like you believe this, you believe that. And we've even seen it a little bit in our community when we oh, spoke sure. out a little bit about some of the ways that we, you know, we just spoke about freedoms and, and unity oh. in that way and already seeing how triggered people get. And those people left and that's okay that's for us. Perfect. Like, you know what I mean? Like, well, I mean, that's another thing to learn from uh, Sam, actually, who talks about every so often he purposefully pushes the envelope of what he's going to say because he knows it will offend a, a certain portion of his audience and he calls it culling barnacles off the bottom of the ship. 
Huh. And uh, it's a beautiful way to think about it. Beautiful way to think about how you can, um, how would you say, opt in to front loading the amputation of mm -hmm. a particular gangrenous part of your audience. Yeah. So every time that I bring a, a woman on, I, one of my most, f my favorite comments, and you guys, you can take this one. Uh, if someone ever posts something that I think is stupid and objectionable in the comments, I'll always just reply and say, this channel is not for you. That's all it needs to be. It's like, look, you're not you're not supposed to be here. Yeah. You've stumbled across this content and maybe you're a subscriber, but I don't want you here. Mm -hmm. And you need to teach your audience. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And also from the audience's side, there's going to be a lot more audience than creators listening. If you care about the creators that you listen to or you watch online, you can genuinely sway their direction toward good if you are careful and considered with the way that you put things across. Mm -hmm. If you care about the content creators that you watch online, if you have your favorite creators, but you think that they're starting to lose their way a little bit, just put a comment that is well-reasoned and doesn't have loads of exclamation mm -hmm. marks in it and say, hey man, look, I, I really I really appreciate all of your work, but I think that you're off on this one. Mm -hmm. Here's a YouTube video that I've seen that I think you would be very interested in. Anytime that one of those things gets fed back up to me by the team, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check that out. Mm -hmm. Someone sends me a, a nice email that's well formatted that says, Chris, big fan of the channel, but I really, really think that you're off on your views about the Russia-Ukraine conflict or whatever, or, or, or Zone 2 cardio or whatever it might be. Uh, here's a TLDR and here's a couple of articles that you should mm -hmm. check out. I'm like, thank you. That's the way to do it. You get, as an audience member, as a fan of anybody, you get the opportunity to direct that creator mm -hmm. toward a better version. You literally get to do a Choose Your Own Destiny Netflix series mm -hmm. where the next time that they go on, mm -hmm. they'll have that in the back of their mind, especially when it's a smaller creator, especially if they're just starting out. Yeah, They're going to read everything. No, for sure, right? You have the opportunity to contribute. And that and that's the magic of it all. That, that is the openness. Like, And I, I, it's happened to us a lot of times it's the feedback it's not always a truth but listening to the feedback considering it thinking about it critically and applying whatever whatever we see valuable from that feedback we get is the way we've pushed ourselves to become more and to become more open and to listen because this again the a versus b thing nobody's listening it's just like emotional triggers to just shut down like you see someone like, I like how you said, like someone that you trust because you build this relationship. These people, they have relationships with creators online and they build this trust. And then the second that someone says something that doesn't, you know, go by whatever narrative they tell themselves about that creator that they're so dedicated to, they literally, it's an emotional trigger. And it's like, and we've seen it on, on our end. Mm -hmm. I, I actually was telling a story the other day about this doctor, Dr. Gregor. He's a plant advocate doctor. He wrote, um, uh, what, what's, uh, how not to die. How not to die. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's like, I, I admired him and all his views and I shared the book with everyone. And when it came time that the vaccines got rolled out, I was like, oh, well, let's see what he has to say. And he was he literally- He wrote a book about how not to die during a pandemic. Yeah, yeah. He had a book called that. And then when the vaccines rolled out, he literally just turned around and was just like, everyone go get vaccinated. Like without anything, without any information, no backup, no nothing. It was just like, I went and did my part, you know, do yours too. And I had like an emotional reaction and I look at it now and I- it's funny because when I see that, I see myself in the people that have done that to us. And it was so interesting because I unfollowed them and I was like, <laughs> and I went onto the newsletter, I found a newsletter email and I was like, nah, unsubscribe. <laughs> like unsubscribe. Yeah. Left That'll a little note. Him. I literally left a little note for feedback why I unsubscribed. And I was like, and I went through this whole thing. Yeah, because you had this expectation of, of someone like him would actually give you some guidance on how to deal with a pandemic yeah. and sickness a natural way because that's what he he teaches is natural remedies for your health and well-being and all of a sudden you have someone that teaches that promoting a chemical you know it was vaccine really that's not but you know that's a very juvenile response right that's oh. coming from the most base it's juvenile but <laughs> it's the bit that you look back on and cringe at i'm i'm saying it out loud but i'm cringing inside <laughs> and actually mark is like saying like we should have dr gregor on a podcast i have I'm to like, i have, have to, to. i know i have to yeah. like it's funny we were talking about that's how this story came up i was like and hopefully we're going to be i think he's from california we're going to be going to california in a few weeks oh. i'm going to reach out to him and be like and i'll, I'll probably tell him the story like it's fine like and because, again you can have a conversation well, well, and even you may have different views exactly. on something like a vaccine but that's fine let's talk about it mm -hmm. let's find the, a, you know the problem that you have is 
people will take any opportunity. Like I said before, you will be remembered by your most outlandish opinion. Mm -hmm. The thing that is most objectionable to whatever group it is that you were a part of, people yeah. thought you were a part of or whatever, that is what they're going to lambast you with. So an absurd ideological belief is a show of fealty to your own side and it's a threat display to the other side. Mm. So what you're saying to your own group is, especially when it's super, super, super absurd, right? Like the earth is flat or whatever. Pick your non-objectionable uh, example of this, <laughs> but I'm sure that you can imagine some of the others. What you're saying to your side is, I care more about the group and my loyalty to it than about reason and sanity itself. Mm. I'm going to put to one side what my eyes and brain and senses and virtue is telling me, and I'm going to adhere to the group ideology wholesale. Now, what happens if you decide to divert from that is you look like an unreliable ally, your own side. Mm -hmm. And to your opposition, you look like a chink in the armor that doesn't have their views correctly set. So all of the work that you got from this particular gentleman, I'm sure that there is a big body of work that you took great value from. Yeah. And then there is an opinion, maybe a large opinion. Yeah. There is an opinion that you didn't. Why on earth dispense oh with all of this? But this is what happens. Sam Harris, you've got TDS. Jordan Peterson, you're a transphobe. Mm -hmm. you know, just pick your favorite cultural commentator. Uh, Piers Morgan, you're racist because you yeah. don't like Meghan Markle. Whatever it is. Right. That, for me, seems like a silly way to do things. You're dispensing with oh, all of their body of work because of this small thing. It's like, look, maybe you should recenter about how much you guys are aligned. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't follow people online because they confirm my worldview wholesale. Exactly. I follow them online because I'm an idiosyncratic individual that's going to take all of these little different pieces. You know the idea of separating the art from the artist, right? Yes. And the then, art being their body of work. The art being the body of work, yeah. That's interesting. No, it's funny too, but like I look at it and it, it, I think I was so charged at a time like where it was so still un... Everything was undetermined, right? And it was a very emotional time. We were in Canada. You know, I was like, I was a powder keg. Like, and he just happened to say a thing which broke a trust. And I forgot the fundamental principle of the whole, everything we've been talking about today is like, he's just behaving in the way that his reality is allowing him to feel safe. And he's doing, and for me to negate the idea that he's ju just doing what he thinks in his experience and his reality is right. For me to have that emotional reaction is so fucking cringy, but to look at it now and be like, I forgive myself for that so that the next time that happens, maybe I can remember the body of work and all of the value. And maybe this story, the reason I'm putting myself out here with this is because maybe others will see this in themselves too, because I think we've all probably had a moment like that to some degree on one level or another, and that self-awareness to recognize it and then to figure out what it is in, in my psyche that I have to do next time to hold on to what it is that I think is more valuable than that emotional reaction, which is a well thought out response and finding, finding the value in the man and not the human that I think is so faulty. Like we're all faulty. We're fucking humans. We're messy and we're ugly and we make, we contradict ourselves constantly and we, you know, like we, and we make these mistakes and I'm not saying he even makes a mistake, but my perception that he made that mistake. That's what's so crazy. That's my fault, not his. And maybe, you know. Coming back to that awareness. And, exactly. And maybe know. people can like, that's the thing is like the openness of like what podcasting is and what's so attractive to us is it's a space where we can just tell stories like this. Share our And share. Views, yeah. And like yourself, when you say like, you know, you listen to lots of podcasts to help you out. Like that's, I mean, Jordan Peterson is a huge thing in my life. Like he helped me understand how to take responsibility. Like to, to leave the Peter Pan behind and grow into what I ultimately could do in service of not just myself, but my family and the world. And if someone wants to villainize him because of his gender ideology, you may not agree with him, but you can't discount the millions of people, the millions of people around the world, mostly men. Yes, of course, we want to throw that in there too, but fuck it. Like, that's amazing to, for him to have a legacy like that. And, and just to be able to like look in a crowd and say, I'm, I bet a lot of people in there found a lot of value from him. Like, let's focus on the good. Let's focus on the body of work. Mm. And, and it's the divisiveness. It's just, 
it really gets me going. And I see, and when I see myself in it, it's funny because it, it gets me going. And then I'm like, oh, that means it's oh, in me still. Me. Yeah. That, means it's, that means I'm still in there. Yeah, the call is coming from inside yeah. the yeah, house. Yeah. It's, it's really. Do it's, you guys feel that over the years when you look at your comments, has it gotten more positive? Are people, because I remember when you had a hotel in the past, who's going to leave like a good review, but when something was really bad about it, people tend to comment on it. Well, so do you feel like over the years, there's like... Our, our comments are amazing. Like we have, to, like it's, it, unless well, I say Jordan Peterson. Well, uh, I, I, think, <laughs> I think in our place, because we're yoga, wellness, mm -hmm. like the majority of people are there just get a service from us and that's what we provide a service yes. right so the comments and the response is always positive yes of course when we're touching on certain subjects and people feel you know a way to express that they don't agree with you and that's fine but yeah I they're mean, on a yoga high so well they, and then we've had like stick to yoga what are you doing those kinds mm -hmm. of things right but stay in your lane stay, stay oh, in your lane one, yeah. thing right? what do you say to stay in your lane what do you what do you think of that comment for me personally i have no n literally zero expertise in anything <laughs> so staying staying in my lane is impossible um yeah. it's it's really one of the freeing. advantages yeah. yeah it's kind of like a uh protectionist strategy that i'm yeah. not i'm not particularly good at any one individual thing whereas you guys actually are i have no lane to get in in the first place but i think you know you guys are obviously being it's a something that you give it's something that the audience gives back to you but it's mostly a transactional relationship it might be a deep relationship but it's a transactional mm -hmm. relationship and the problem that you have is when your favorite yoga sequence creator says something objectionable that you don't agree with right. or whatever and it's like okay well can i do do i need to have every player on the soccer team that i support agree with my beliefs in x sure. y or z does that mean if one of them doesn't, that I can't support the team anymore? Mm -hmm. The body of work should be bigger. That's the art and the artist thing, right? That's separating the art from the artist. Yeah. That's cool. Not to switch the subject, but you mentioned this, and I'm really, really curious just on your opinion and view, but what do you think about the Ukraine-Russia Okay, you mentioned? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm just so curious. I'm, What's I'm Ukrainian. Ukrainian. I have family in Ukraine. Oh, wow. So it's I, why are you asking me? Give, well, why just, you give us the insight. Well, I'm curious about... I mean, you have such an interesting way of looking well, at things. Obviously, talked about and, it yeah, publicly. If you were getting some a little kind of... bit, I mean, I've I've spoken about it a little bit. This is one of those times where I could and probably would say some bro science opinion pulled out of my ass. But I'm going to try and do something which is relatively rare online and say that I don't have an educated opinion on this. Um, I have seen what's going on. I haven't done the research in order to be able to give you a, a proper opinion. I think that it is going to create a very interesting template for China and Taiwan to look at with regards to how is America and the UK going to respond to aggression. I think that Germany re being completely reliant on renewable sources of energy was com absolutely stupid and is now showing just how fragile that particular system is i think that it highlights some of the dangers of being overly reliant on green energy i think that the from what i can see the spirit of the ukrainian people is fucking hardcore and you guys are like <laughs> absolutely built for punishment and it's very impressive in a sort of stoic stiff upper lip battle of britain type scenario yeah. But outside of that, I'd just be throwing horse shit out into the world. That and wasn't just... horse shit, No, that actually. was not. That's so interesting. Too. Uh, nothing but... insightful about the actual conflict. But... No, but I think what's interesting is to look at a conflict like that and for you to pull out, like, and form some kinds, like, fig... Tr and all of that was kind of not in a way of this is how it is, but there's something to be said about how China and Taiwan will look at it. I'll, like, take, I'll, I'll take that. No, it's beautiful, actually. Like, because, as you said as well, most people don't negate to have an opinion. Everyone thinks that... Well, I think everyone just looks at what they're fed from the mainstream media and they believe this is what it is. And then they have no problem spouting out an opinion based on that. Exactly. Right? exactly. It's very dangerous it's... To, to look at to the world like that. Oh my it God. is, yeah. To just re-parrot. But, I mean, thinking's hard. It really and, is. I mean, where else <laughs> can difficult. you go, right? I mean, for us, like, for me, I, I feel like I have a different eye on it because I, I have friends and family there. I have a friend that's on the front lines, you know what I mean? So I see and I, I know a lot of the truth that they wouldn't speak about on the mainstream media and, like, the corruption that is happening through all well, of the money. That's well, on being, all sides. On all sides, you know what I mean? And 
it's just, it's really interesting. And I'm really just curious to see like how all of this information is being brought forward because I myself don't, I have no idea what's going on. You know what I mean? It's like, I know how like scary it is and how sad it is and like kind of dealing on that physical plane of just like praying for my friend that's in the hospital right now. Hopefully he's not going to get sent for the fourth time to the front lines because they keep doing that to him. You know what I mean? All of these things. But um, it's just really interesting of how they're positioning it from the mainstream media and to watch the parallel of it all. And This is one of the first conflicts that's been reported on so heavily with footage coming from inside Ukraine. I mean, I saw a TikTok when it very, very first started. I saw a TikTok of some Instagrammy sort of good-looking girl in a low-cut top explaining to Ukrainian citizens how to start and drive a Russian tank in case you came across one. And it was a TikTok. It was a selfie video, like complete with dubstep overlay music oh, and wow. stuff. And you know those ones where they go like, <laughs> and the three different labels pop up? It was yep. like, first you press the this button, then you flick the these switches. And I'm thinking we are like floss... <laughs> we are floss dancing our way through the apocalypse here aren't we yeah um yeah. but i my point being that it's the first time that we've had so much news coverage of any one thing mm -hmm. uh, that that's happened live and what you're seeing is competing narratives being used so that nobody can come to any conclusion about one thing oh yeah like the only thing that you know is that almost all of the news that you're seeing that's coming out of that region is probably propaganda that's the only thing that you can be certain of. And both sides too. Right. Because like, exactly, yeah. I have, my dad's Russian. So I have family in Russia and in Ukraine. She's a very and unique position. literally yes. like my, gra my, my grandmother, one of my grandmothers who lives in Russia, you can't speak to her about this conflict. She was like, you know, Russia's, well, you were, we're liberating Ukraine. And you're like, oh, oh, you know what I mean? Like literally this is how deep the propaganda is going from one side to the other. And they're both like, Again, there's a lot to say on both sides, but it's just like, this is crazy. Like how deep they're getting into people's minds and yeah, how much they're working against. And that fog of war has never been so thick. That's yeah. what's so fascinating. To the point that it's not just mainstream, but then you get the you get the opinions of the TikTokers. And I mean, where did this girl, first of all, learn to start a tank? So I actually <laughs> think I, I actually think this was maybe put across by some you maybe even like Ukrainian government type right. account. So presumably mm -hmm. they'd got some big TikTok yeah. person. Like, could you? Who's the big one? Is it Addison Lee? Addison Ray? <laughs> right. Addison Ray. Could you imagine if the U.S. gets into got into war with Canada or something like that, <laughs> and then the, the U.S. government recruits Addison Ray to explain how to take over a Canadian naval submarine or some shit like that? Yeah. She's like, first you've got to turn the thing. <laughs> right. I don't know, but yeah, I I think that. A more pernicious way to look at what's happening with information, misinformation, conspiracy is what's happening on TikTok mm. uh, generally in the US versus in China. Right. So in China, the algorithm doesn't push people doing stupid dances and stuff like that. Yeah. It's aspirational, inspirational, young people doing engineering, achieving in music and art and philosophy wow, and no things idea. like that. Mm -hmm. They're able to engineer their population to look up to the sort of things that they value. If you're a child in China, you cannot play video games outside of between 7 and 9 p.m. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The only way that you can get games is through a streaming platform, kind of like Netflix mm -hmm. or Steam would wow. be more of an equivalent. And it's just not on. Wow. If it's huh. not 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it doesn't exist. Meanwhile, exactly. people are literally TikTok dancing their way to an early aneurysm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 21.6 trillion minutes of TikTok was watched in 2021. 9.6 trillion minutes of Netflix was watched. So it's double in a wow. bit the amount of time. That amount of time. Can you imagine what people could have achieved if they spent that time not watching TikTok videos, but actually applying themselves to anything else? <laughs> you know what I mean? Anywhere where this is that zone themselves. of comfortable complacency again. Yeah. Right? Like it's not that good, but it's not that bad. That's distraction. Yeah, I know, right? And it's funny to see the. Chinese government playing their hand at that, like propping up their citizens with that kind of content. Oh, absolutely. Like that's, that's astounding. That's yeah. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you have uh, political content in the U S be pushed like mm -hmm. divisive political mm -hmm. content mm -hmm. that 
riles people up and causes them to go loot or burn or or not vote or yeah. vote in a particular direction. Right. Uh, yeah, I think it would be one of the biggest and easiest net positives for the entire West if they just said TikTok gets taken off all of the app stores and we can't use it anymore. Like, tell me, tell me the case for having TikTok on anybody's phone. Like, I, I simply don't see a use case for it. It's not used to connect with your friends. Mm. It's not sufficiently long to actually be able to learn really anything of value. There's girls on there that are uh, explaining different ways to self-harm so that your parents can't see it and that doesn't get taken down. There's this entire, I watched this really disturbing YouTube video about basically a um, industry of live TikToks that are happening all over the world, but a lot of them in America, of underage girls not showing anything that would technically be illegal, but you can tip live on TikTok, right? You can send it. It's like you send that. an emoji, or it, I think it's a badge of, of some mm -hmm. kind. And um, there's a whole code that the people that watch use in order to communicate with the mostly girls that are performing in these live things. And these are like 13, 14, 15 year old girls that are doing this. And it's not technically illegal, but fuck me, it's like really, really unethical. And you wouldn't like to guess the sort of age of the people that are on the other side of the... Performing. Like, it's just like, um, we can't see you move back. Like, I can't remember oh, like, the I can't remember the codes. It was like one of those things, it was stuff to do with like, show your feet and things. Oh, that, okay. Stuff that's not going to be, that's not gonna cross terms of service. It's also probably not gonna land somebody in jail. But it's... Maybe it should. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Very just, my point being, just that's TikTok can go, that, and we free up twenty one point six trillion minutes <laughs> per year. I mean, if you want an efficiency and productivity yeah, gain, seriously. how about we just do that? I remember we were in Dubai, and um, one of my friends was talking to this girl, and it was just interesting. She was a good bit younger than us, maybe like nineteen or something, and uh, he was saying, "Can you just can I borrow your phone for a second? And he went into screen time and went on to her daily screen time usage. 12 hours of screen time a day, eight hours a day on TikTok. Wow. Just some chick. I hadn't picked someone from the TikTok addicts club. He just picked some right. chick. Just a big. Yeah, 12 it, hours and eight. Well, well it's like, an addiction, right? Oh, it's for sure. It's in, in more than an so addiction. I spoke to Huberman about this, uh -huh. and I use that language as well. I think that he is right when he says it's a compulsion, not an addiction. What's the difference between that? The addiction would have a payoff. Oh, oh. <laughs> but wouldn't the payoff be like the the, the dopamine effect? Or the... It just goes to baseline. You don't even have really any dopamine hit anymore as you start scrolling through things. You do for about 45 minutes. And if you think about the way that we use our phones, it's compulsive, not addictive. So if you've ever been on a plane and you've pulled your phone out of your pocket, you know you don't have signal, right? You're 35,000 oh, yeah. feet in the air and you go through the apps. Like, what is that? That's not an addiction. That's a compulsion. That's the myelin sheets that have been laid down for you to go Facebook, no. TikTok, no. Instagram, no. Like, that's a compulsion. Now, I, someone probably needs to dig into a bit more, and it was only one very short interaction I had with Huberman, but it changes the way that I view people's phone use from addiction to compulsion. And I think that the way that you treat a, a compulsion and addiction is a little bit a little bit different. And it also takes, for me it gives people a little bit more ownership mm. over what they're doing. I'm just, com I'm compelled to do this, right? This is a compulsion. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do I get around that? As opposed to an addiction just has so much baggage that comes mm -hmm. with it when I'm addicted to my phone. And but it's a more of a victim, a victimhood when you're- I think so. The addiction is, you know, they say it's, it's a disease. Yep. Comp would compulsion be a disease? I don't know. Well, OCD would certainly be a disorder. Yeah. Disorder, yeah. Disorder, right? Obsessive compulsive disorder. A friend once told me something that was so valuable for this. She, when she pulls out her phone, she said, do I use this to connect or to escape? You know, and that really helped me. I was like, okay, no, I'm not touching this phone to, if it's to connect with something or someone, great. Mm -hmm. But then if it's to disconnect or like to, I mean, we need a bit of escapism in our lives too. You're but always, yeah. Yeah, we you need advocate. a tiny bitch. You always advocate. When I get too much about the self-control aspect. self-control. But still, you. like, that's... And I, I also think there's no hygiene on this yet because this phone, it, it's not a phone already to begin with. It's something else. A little computer. Yeah. yeah, it's a little computer. And we are not educating ourselves on it. Like, this is just a thing that we have. It's always there. It's always available. 
And I, I wonder if in the future, like in schools, if this could be something that could be introduced in the educational system, like how to actually use that technology. Because we don't Digital know. Digital hygiene, I think, is probably already being taught, but it'll be the same way that sex education would have been taught while we were in school. Like, so this is the vulva. And this is the whatever. Like, I don't even know what that is. Um, oh, no. But, uh, yeah, come on, Chris. But... I think that you're totally correct. Understanding not just safety online about don't meet people from the internet and here's how to not use a password that's one, two, three, four, five. Mm. Genuine hygiene for using these sorts of apps. I had a, a really nice sequence of um, videos from someone that listens to the podcast that I got on my Instagram yesterday. And she said, uh, my daughter's 12 or 13 years old, British person, and uh, we all of her friends have got phones and all of them have got TikTok and we were sort of battling at the moment mm -hmm. about whether or not to give it to her and she listened to this podcast I did with Johan Hari who wrote uh, Stolen Focus which is a good book and um, she said after doing that our conviction was re-energized and we realized that this is we, we've made the right choice even if it's not something that's good for her now the same as the baby that wants ice cream or the audience yeah. member that wants red meat it's something that she'll be thankful for in future. We don't know what will happen to young minds that use this sort of technology. It is so malleable when you're young. Think about all of the formative behaviors and stuff. And you've got three-year-olds, kids whose brains haven't, you haven't even got theory of mind yet, right? You haven't developed theory of mind and the kid's crying at the dinner table. So you just give it the phone and put mm -hmm. YouTube for kids on and it'll mm -hmm. shut it up. And there's no study done yet because we actually haven't been able to understand what is the long-term effects because it's only recently yeah, and these like, kids are using iPads and iPhones and staring at a screen at a dinner table for two hours. Well, you know the, the I mean? data is starting to come out in teenagers, the, the, this generation. And yeah, the that's John Height's work, isn't it? Yeah, and the yeah. depression is up, the self-harm is up, the all self-esteem issues, like everything is just going like exponentially rising and it seems to be directly connected to when phones and social media became 2013, such a thing. yeah. So um, Scott Galloway, I was just had him on my show before I came here mm. and he said that tonight... 4,000 sets of parents will take their kids to the emergency room because they're terrified that if they leave them in their room on their own, they're not going to wake up with them in the morning. That's how many are getting taken into ERs for self-harm every single day in wow. America, 4,000. That's crazy. That's like, I don't know. It's, we have, we have a, he's almost two. So we have a, a, a young little guy, Xavier, and we spend a lot of time thinking about how to handle his sort of graduation into a world where digital technology and the phone, which is actually not a phone, is such a huge part culturally of even just being able to thrive, being able to do what's best for yourself. And, and how do you manage the, you know, that sort of, it's almost like a rite of passage at this point. I in, would agree. Yeah, into yeah, society, yeah. because at this point we know it's very clear. He's not touching it. You know, it's, it's not a part of what we want his formative years, these very impressionable times to be. But um, I still have yet to figure out, and maybe if you have an opinion or you've talked to somebody about what is the, is there any theories about what a healthy strategy to teach hygiene or to actually introduce these things into their life in a way that won't end up with what, like being a statistic like we're both talking about right now? As of yet, I haven't seen anyone that's got more than anecdotal evidence right. and stuff that practically sounds good. One of the studies that I did see that was very interesting was around parents' own phone use around toddlers and children. So one of the things that the child will notice is where mummy and daddy's attention is. And if they hear bing and they look up and they see mum and dad putting attention onto this device, hmm. that changes the power dynamic. That changes how they oh. see the value within a room. So I think that parents need to be incredibly careful not only of their children's use, but of their use around their children. Um, so... The best strategies that I've seen, Rogan, Ben Bergeron, and Savan Matosian. So Savan has a channel about uh, raising his three sons. Uh, he's an ex-CrossFit coach. Uh, ben Bergeron is one of the best CrossFit coaches on the planet, and Rogan's Rogan. Uh, and all of them have basically got the same rule, which is no phones in the house. If you want to go the use house. your go outside. Wow. Step outside of the front door. Before. So I'm pretty sure that Rogan, uh, Ben, I think, has uh, like shoe pockets at the front door. And the girls, that he's got a ton of girls, uh, the girls will come in with their friends and everybody knows they've got to put their phones in the wow. in the thing. They have a I slumber party. <laughs> That's, Heaven. you got to leave the phone. But think about this. This is something that I, I'm not a dad yet, but I can't wait to be a dad. And um, 
I really look forward to having something greater than myself to break my use of my device for because I use it because I don't have a strong enough excuse not to really. I don't need to, uh, but I would say for sure, using the opportunity to set a good example for your son as a uh, vehicle of transformation for you as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, how cool is that? It's, mm -hmm. it's like I've made my life better and mm -hmm. through doing that, I've made my son's life better as well. That's pretty cool. But yeah, I think in terms of hard and fast rules, you need to do things that have no negotiation in it. So for me personally, this is whether I use my phone, I have intermittent fasting for my phone. Right, so I don't use it before 9 a.m. I don't use it after 8 p.m. Uh, I try to only ever using it standing up because studies suggest that if you're sat in a comfortable seat, then you're going to continue mm. to use it. Mm. You need to increase the friction in order to use your phone. When you use your phone, go outside. Or for me, I didn't do that. Not quite so hardcore. Stand up. Don't use mm. it before a certain time. Don't use it after a certain time. Hard and fast, easy rules. When it comes to kids, I would say have areas of the house that you're not allowed to use it in, perhaps certainly super simple things sleep with your phone outside of your bedroom make yeah, sure that yeah. blah 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 mm -hmm. um but yeah it needs to be very easy bright lines black and white thinking something that a three-year-old can understand uh other than that we need more data uh, yeah. i think but really what are we going to see the <laughs> best the best that we can hope for is it's not quite as bad as we feared that's yeah. That's really the that's best we that we can hope for. for. It's insane that that's the best, yes. but I can't see any other way that it wouldn't come at just that. Just, well, it's a little better than we thought. A little bit. Like, what? Yeah. It's, that's, that's, that's really interesting. You mentioned Rogan, and I, just to shift gears on that, you were on Rogan recently. Yes. Um, and that was um, fantastic to watch. I think Thank you. He, like, it was a really, really great episode. What was that like on the other end? Afterward? Or no, the, just the whole, th even how did that come together? He slid into my DMs on Instagram. Just a sweet do. slide in? Yeah. Like what? Hey brother, let's record a podcast. Well, that's really? cool. Yeah. yeah. So, which was nice. I, I was at the time I was recording a Q and A uh, for the channel that said, uh, and someone asked me like, you're in Austin. When are we going to see you on Rogan? I was like, I'm pretty sure the guy doesn't have any idea who I am. And then came after this message. I was like, I look like an idiot. <laughs> um, but it was great, man. I mean, it's strange. I'm uh, perennially... Uh, feeling imposter syndrome, or I have done for, for a good while. Uh, confidence is something that I've had to build up incredibly slowly. Mm. But I've got myself around a group of people who have so much self-belief in their own talents that it started to rub off on me, which feels very, very good. That's and cool. um, one of my friends said a while ago about something different, but it maps onto this situation. This is what I meant to happen. Like, this isn't an accident. Mm. It's not that having... Peterson, Jocko, Huberman, and Rogan in the space of one year after moving to Austin was an error. That's actually what I was aiming for. Now, it's maybe not specifically what I had planned, right. but if you're working towards something and imposter syndrome continues to rear its head and then you keep disproving it in the real world, if the imposter syndrome persists, you have to admit to yourself after a while it's got nothing to do with your competence and everything to do with your addiction of feeling like an imposter. Mm. Right, there's the, the confidence and competence are two sides of the same coin. Right, you either have more confidence, or you you have um, you want your confidence to be further than where your competency level is, or you want your confidence to catch up to where your competence level is. Right, those are the two options that you have. One of them, you need to do more iterations and be more successful. The other one, you need to get rid of your imposter syndrome. Those are the only two real issues that I see. And for me, getting to that stage, it felt like a stamp of authenticity. It felt like a uh, a nice certification that all of the work that I'd put in over 500 and something episodes over the last four and a bit years was being noticed by people that I cared about and right. people whose opinion I respected. And he said some very nice things afterward uh, and we've kept in touch. I'm going to catch up with him, I think, within the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And it's cool, man. I mean, you're going to have him on your podcast as well, right? I think so. Yes. Which will be fun to uh, get him into my domain for once. Oh, yeah. uh, but wow. that being said, I mean, the similar to today, right? The conversation isn't, it's not a dynamic of uh, host and guest. It's just a, it's very sort of uh, egalitarian in terms of who gets to lead the conversation, which is cool. Um, but yeah, it, it's good, man. I, I think 
For a very long time, I never had a pursuit that I could commit myself to fully. Jordan Peterson, try mm -hmm. as hard as you can at one thing and see what happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I never had that before. And the opportunity to have that, this is one of the things that I really wish that I could gift most conscientious people that want to feel like they're making progress is like, just find a thing. It doesn't matter what it is. Just find a thing and do the thing. Mm -hmm. Do the thing as frequently as you commit to it for three months or six months and just see what happens. Yeah. And off the back of that, you end up realizing how capable uh you can be and then that's the runaway train so there's one final thing that we hadn't spoken about earlier on that was interesting which is getting from zero to one yeah mm -hmm. or getting from 90 to 95 people at zero almost can't believe the capacity of the people that are at 90 or 95 mm -hmm. it seems inhuman to them right but the matthew principle which is taken from matthew in the bible and mm -hmm. says from those who have everything more will be given from those who have nothing more will be taken and it explains the fact that especially in a meritocracy the people that are incredibly successful beget more success if you have money you can invest it that gets you more money which gets you more investing money which blah, da, 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 da. but confidence and competence work the same way right. if you can begin by developing a little bit of competence it reinforces confidence which means that you can then push yourself a bit further which means that you can then go a little bit more and then before you know it the flywheel's running and you start to move in all manner of different domains the same reason why people that start a, and stick at a fitness regime, I'm going to guess like doing yoga as well, will see transformations in other areas of their life too. Oh, yeah. uh, well, I, I didn't think that I could get my single arm balance or whatever. And then I got it after two and a half years of working at it. And I realized that the awkward conversation I got to have with my boss tomorrow as well is just another, another challenge for me to face. So all of these different things, um, especially when it comes to the relationship between confidence and competence, is a uh self-sustaining cycle mm -hmm. that speeds up and for most people the problem is just beginning with a little mm -hmm. bit of action whatever the first step of action is get someone that you can work with make yourself accountable to yourself or to somebody else and just do a thing and then celebrate the wins when you do one week of perfect meditation or one week of doing right. you know the uh yoga routines each yeah. day like celebrate it because mm -hmm. that's good and then you'll come back and do it again and again and then in five years time you look back and go i am unrecognizable to the person mm -hmm. that i was before do you feel unrecognizable to when you started the podcast yeah very much so that's the really texture of my own mind is incredibly different i think mm -hmm. so i have this um app on my phone called day one it's like a journaling app it's password protected and you can put photos and other bits and pieces in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's what I use for big shit that happens in my life. It's not, I had a sandwich today or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I remember this is when I was still running club nights, probably about eight years ago. And I put in that the MC, the guy that speaks over the mic in the hip hop room. So the second room of a club night that we ran on a Saturday had left. And I was adamant that this was going to be the beginning of the end for the entire company. And I, I, I don't even remember the guy's name. My point being that I was so neurotic and nervous about losing success that something so small had created such a big deal to me. And I, I almost wish that we could take um, photos of our mind in a way, and then we could go back and revisit the texture of what it was like to be us. Because you only ever, it's one of the very few things, even progress photos of your single arm balance or whatever, yeah. you can see I was here and now I'm here and that's more mobility or whatever. But we only ever have the memories of our own internal states and nobody else has experienced them. So there's, it's completely just open to biases. But yeah, man, committing yourself to one thing and trying as hard as you can to see what happens uh, can transform the way that you see yourself and the world. Right. Committing yourself, but also dedicating yourself to that, right? Like, because even the way you treat podcasts, like you're like an athlete, like you're dedicated. You're not just focused on, you know, committing yourself three times a day a week to this but you're also really taking care of yourself your mind your body the what you eat how you use your phones like all of this is part of it so it's like true dedication it's something that you're fully applying yourself to so well that's the ordinating principle again right it's very easy to work out what i'm supposed to do if i know that the only thing that i have to do tomorrow i've got a guy called destiny who's this big streamer mm -hmm. all i have to do tomorrow is podcast well with him do I want to drink tonight? I'm going to a meal tonight. Do I want to drink tonight? Well, does that make me perform better tomorrow? No. Mm. Okay, then I don't. Mm -hmm. Super easy. Right. Super easy decision. 
do I want to stay up late and go on my phone? No, I need to sleep. Mm -hmm. Do I want to get up and go and train? Yes, because it's going to make me perform mm -hmm. better in the afternoon. Like mm -hmm. it's really, really, really easy. So mm -hmm. the dedication thing becomes so much easier when you have one goal or a small number of goals. You know, I'm pretty sure you could probably slide a family in alongside that or slide or whatever in alongside mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. There's a book called Essentialism by Greg McHugh. And if anybody feels like this is resonating with them, it's one of the uh, 10 most important books that I've read. And uh, I highly recommend that you read that. It just reminds you that the vital few uh, points of contribution you have in your life are the ones that matter. Almost, it's 99.99999% of your contribution. Everything else is just noise. Everything else is just a waste. And in that pursuit, I mean, a book that actually has helped us a lot on our way, I think I saw it on your reading list as well, too. The um the the war of art the oh god art. yeah um how do you deal with resistance because to do what you do on that regularity and to have that single focus i understand it and I'm, it's a constant i've come to actually appreciate the grapple mm. in a way like when resistance enters the room and with its new tactic every time yeah. um always coming at me um i've come to a point in life where i'm just like well what do I have to fucking do this time to get around Struggle this? again, yeah. Like, so how, how do you deal with the resistance? Because the, the level of frequency you're working at, three podcasts a week, like everything about your life, and I understand that kind of, like that kind of dedication. Um, do you have a, a specific technique or a perspective that you look at resistance with? One advantage of the particular way that I've set up this type of publishing schedule is that I actually don't need that much motivation myself because I'm always talking to somebody else, I'm not going to stop the conversation halfway through because I run out of energy. But if anybody's ever tried to script a YouTube video, it is painful. It is so painful. And you don't want to write the script and then you get to, and you're like, oh, I'm going to record it at 10 o'clock. I'll push the recording back till 11 o'clock because there's nobody that I'm accountable to for the recording. And then it's tomorrow and then it's the day after. Mm. The podcast for me is perfect because I don't look stupid in front of the guests, so I got to prepare. I don't look stupid in front of them, so I'm going to have to read about them Yikes. and I got to learn them and all the rest of it. Okay, and then I'm sitting down to record. There's a time that I have to do it at because they're going to be there. And then speaking to the guest means I'm not going to stop halfway through and blah, blah, blah. And then before I know it, I've done it. Yeah. So I've structurally changed the way that my life is put together in order to bypass resistance. Now there's still some stuff that I have to do on my own, writing show notes and coming up with thumbnail ideas. That's difficult. Um, with things like that, I try and stack tasks that I don't want to do on top of things that make me feel good. So I bought a, an exercise bike. So it's a desk that has a bike, like a uh, what would you, recumbent bike underneath it. So as I'm working, I can just turn my feet over. And by the time that I've done 50 emails, I'll have burned 400 calories. Uh, so is that to help you with the emails or with getting on the bike? Both. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't do zone two cardio on its own. And yeah. I fucking hate emails. <laughs> so by having, by having them both together, I go, I really can't be bothered to do cardio. And I distaste, I, I dislike emails. But if I get off, I know that I've won on two it, two counts let's say that they're both five out of ten in terms of uh, what i want to do mm. but together they're they're all right and it makes me feel <laughs> it makes me feel a bit better about it so trying to combine them in that sort of a way uh, also another another interesting thing most people do their to-do lists based on their availability but a better way to match it is based on your energy so if you're the sort of person that has most of their energy first thing in the morning do your most difficult task of the day then i would say that's probably about 70 percent of people far more people than think it are morning people they just try and push things later in the day right. um there's a concept that i came up with called anxiety cost which i told peterson about so you might be familiar with um the longer that you put off doing a task the more time is taken up thinking about the fact you haven't done the task so postponing a problem extends it basically mm -hmm. if you have to answer some emails do that now mm -hmm. because you're going to spend one minute times 10 times over the next five hours thinking that you need to answer those emails yep. and those 10 minutes you could have just had to be in bliss right and plus all of the extra sympathetic arousal that you're going to have from just being a little bit irritated and i know i've got something to do but i can't remember what it is oh well, for sure um so yeah uh stacking is one way to get around stuff um the approach that pressfield has where it's a very sort of esoteric almost mystical uh way that he talks about stuff i like from a narrative perspective 
but for me, I needed something that grew more corn, right? Yeah. I needed something that was that was more practical. But everybody should go and read that. The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield and then Turning Pro by him as well. It's an hour and a half. Listen, each of them. Yeah. Uh, and Turning Pro, that one chapter in The War of Art was the difference between me being what I was two and a half years ago on the show and what I am now. That it one was, chapter. Yeah, wow. one chapter. You know, the professional is the person that shows up on time. The yeah. professional is the person that stands on the stadium floor, even knowing that the stands might shout at him the, da, 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 yeah. da, da, all the way down. And I thought, all right, I'm going to turn pro. And I made it, I'd said it on the show. I was like, this is the week that I'm going to start treating this like a professional. And you mentioned the athlete thing, far more people than know it would benefit from treating their pursuit like an athlete does. You know, your sleep, your nutrition, the people that you spend your time with, your mindset, your preparation, all of that stuff. It's only really athletics and kind of elite music, like orchestral music and stuff, that that's not seen as being a bit strange to do in. If it's not a sport or it's not some sort of eye polluting pursuit, yeah. people, I think one of the reasons is that a lot of the stuff that we do now, people want to see it as being effortless. And what that means is that putting in a ton of effort kind of takes away from the fact, well, yeah, I could have done I could have done whatever that is had I have spent as much time on it as well. It's like, okay, but you didn't. That's, yeah. Or they want to also perceive it as, it, you know, oh, they're just gifted. I find that's really interesting too. Or they have the talent to do that and, mm. and, and it negates their 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 acknowledgement that the of the work that they had to do, which is they could possibly do it too if they put that work in as well. Correct. Yes. Like, it throws anybody that does well throws your own insufficiencies into quite harsh light. It's one of the reasons why being around a group that understands you and supports you is so important. Right. And yeah, I mean I think that's key is the people you surround yourself with too. Because if you're around people that are pulling you down, partying, not appreciating what you're focused on. I mean, you're going to become the people you surround yourself with, right? So at times you have to do a little, little bit of people cleansing. Yep. In the same way you've got to amputate yeah. the gangrenous parts exactly. of your audience, you've got to do it with your friends yeah. as well. And it's hard because mm. there are sometimes people that, you know, have been childhood friends with you and you have such a deep bond and relationship, but when you can step away and actually look at these people and realize that they're not serving your growth, they're not helping you expand and really perceive that next potential of yourself, then you have to break that relationship. You have to break up with those people, unfortunately. Or, and I don't like, I like what you're saying, but I think also to... To maintain the respect for what it was course, because a yeah. lot of people yeah. think like oh i just need to leave these people oh, in my no. dust it's like you can always be friends but you don't have to put so much stock you just in kind them. of slowly no. distance yourself That's away from them right an interesting way to think about it because it can seem a little sterile and transactional to think about yeah. well this friend has stopped adding something to my life therefore mm. i must get rid of them it's not what we're saying what yeah. we're saying is that it is not your duty to save people that don't want to be saved that's, That's nice, true. actually. You know, if people don't want to be saved, it's not your job to jump jump into the river after them and drown. I spent a lot of time trying to save some people. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. That's so strong. Yeah. And I've never thought of it that way. Wow. And I, and not to say that you were saying it that way, but because no, no, I know I, the grace that you have managed to navigate. I've had to cleanse stuff at all. Yeah, and you navigate it very well. And actually, mm -hmm. like, I, I watch you hang on to that which is the most, tr like, truest form of like respect and honor what it was, but to also recognize all things have a beginning and all things have an end. And it's okay if things end, but it doesn't have to be like oh, done yeah, over, course. you know, like it's, that's really interesting though. Well, a lot of young people as well don't have friends. They have drinking partners. Yeah. Right. Party friends. Yeah. Yep. If the only way that you can bear to be around the people that you hang with is to be drunk, you definitely need better friends. Mm -hmm. You have to sedate yourself away from the boredom or the annoyance or the irritation or the lack of cohesion or whatever is lurking in the background of your friendships. The only way that you can do that is by drinking. Time to get yourself a different social circle. Yeah, maybe you can do some, some litmus tests on that. See if you can go, like, because I remember a time in my life where everything you had to do, was like, and who's bringing the alcohol? Or and who's doing, <laughs> you know, and, and what bar are we starting out at? And, and when it gets to a point when we stop drinking in our life, all of a sudden you saw the phone ring a lot less. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like when you did invite someone to do something, there was either like you fall into simpatico or it becomes extremely awkward and uncomfortable. And it, it tells you something really strong. You, you have the opportunity in those situations to be a good example though for people. Everybody needs a first mover. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody needs the person that's going to begin going from zero to one from 
like unconscious incompetence to conscious competence or conscious incompetence. Somebody needs to make that first step. In the UK, I was a club promoter for 15 years and I started going sober because I just wanted more time and consistency to spend on, on stuff that I cared about, like things like the podcast. And I wasn't drinking that much, but I was drinking every couple of weeks. And I found that going sober was really, really good for me. I found the productivity and blah, blah, blah. And downstream from that, like five lads that worked for us that were 21 were like, I'm going to go sober for a month. I'm like, dude, great. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. It took me 10 years on top of that for right. me to even start thinking about this. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, you can be that the same way that a audience member can contribute to their favorite creator, a friend can be the first mover for the friends that I are love around that. them. Yeah. It's, you know, we say it a lot, go being the light. Just if you find it in yourself to be the light and to shine first, it only inspires others to look for that mm -hmm. in themselves. I think that's a really, really beautiful that's a beautiful example with a very, you know, I guess, I mean, do you drink? Do you drink? Not, not like, much now. Yeah. Um, it's purposeful. It's intentional now yeah. if I do. I, that's the thing is I would never say I'm not a drinker because I don't know once every, what, you know what I mean? It becomes purposeful and, and yeah, the intentionality, if it comes to alcohol, is like, you know, I don't know. There's sometimes a cel like a celebration or just a night where we just like, Hey, let's have a glass I'm of wine. I'm going to watch, I don't know, some country music gig with 10,000 people. I'm going to see my friend uh, Ollie play a gig in Houston this Monday, right? Mm -hmm. It'll be a big show and there'll be loads of people there and it'll, it'll be support acts and all the rest of it. I'm not not having a beer. <laughs> like I'm going to cheers a beer to yeah, my yeah. bro who plays yeah. in front of 10,000 people and I'm going to say congratulations, Matt. That's beautiful. But it doesn't, like that's, in, it, it's intentional. Mm -hmm. totally. And this is the big difference. So I did, a, I did 500 days without caffeine. I did 1,000 days without alcohol, but I did 500 days without caffeine. That's if you want an addiction that's hard for some mm -hmm. people to kick, that's yeah. a really, really diff difficult one that's staring them in the face. Huh. Um, but if you need a substance to perform, it's stopped conferring a benefit. Yeah. If you need alcohol in order to be sufficiently socially lucid that you can bear to talk to people on a night out, that's not helping you. That's the only way that you can do something. If you need three coffees before midday, in order to get yourself through work and without them you would die that's not conferring a benefit mm -hmm. that is you being reliant it's buttressing your life and it's also papering over the cracks of hang on why is it that i'm so tired or why is it that i don't have any confidence around people and you can go through life again zone of comfortable complacency without ever actually looking at the root cause of what's going on it's just every morning i put a band-aid over this bullet wound every single morning right and i'll never actually look at the root cause of why it's happening huh. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Honestly. And um, I mean, you have a wonderful podcast, Modern Wisdom. We'll definitely include the links to it in, in the show description here. But is there anywhere else that uh, people can follow you and connect with you? Sure. So Modern Wisdom, wherever you listen, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, YouTube is Chris Williamson. If you're going to get started, the Jordan Peterson, the second episode, we can throw that in the show notes. And yes. then Andrew Huberman, we've also mentioned today. So there's two episodes to get people started if mm -hmm. they want to try that. And then we've mentioned a bunch of different books today. I've got oh, a list of 100 books that you should read before you die. And they're all sorted by fiction and nonfiction and why I like them. And there's lists and links mm -hmm. to go and get them. And that's chriswillx.com slash books. You can just go and get that for free. We'll put all of that in the show notes for sure. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for it's having me, guys. Welcome, such awesome. a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Amazing. <laughs> all right. Awesome. The wrap. Yeah, of course. <gasps> Chris. My pleasure.